So hello, welcome Hi. <laughs> to uh, Thanks for Jumping on the Eddie Conversation podcast. You know, thanks for having me. Really, yeah. really, really great. Yes, and you are uh, Paul and James Houghton. There you go. Yes, I almost <laughs> fumbled that even though we just went over it. Which is, which is funny because of your new video you just right. put out there <laughs> yes. with your name pronunciation. Yeah, name pronunciations are tricky. Yeah, right. Yeah. For you too, right? Do you, yeah. It, so did you, did the, did my, because I, I released a... All right, really quickly, before we jump into that, you're a screenwriter, filmmaker, creative producer. Yes. Is how you have yourself described, I think, on like your website and stuff. Very good, yeah. yeah. Um, before we jump into more of who you are, let's talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a true creator. Always wanted to talk about themselves. Um, so you, okay, I made a little video for Instagram joking about my name pronunciation. Did you... It was amazing. Did you learn... Through, through that, what my name is actually pronounced. I'm sitting here thinking that you were literally going to ask this, right? Okay. <laughs> and you break it on me. Um, yeah, I mean, is it v- well. v- <laughs> Virgil? <laughs> I'd say it, no, tell us. So it's V Hill. V Hill. Yeah. That's close to first time, right? Yeah, v- yeah. You have to excuse me because I was laughing so hard afterwards. It's hard to remember, you know, yeah. the, the correct version because it was absolutely funny. I think it was really, really creative, fantastic. Thanks. Thank Give you. yourself some props. There. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, all right. So enough about me. That's all. That's all. <laughs> all the time I get. I w- let's talk about you, and uh, I guess we'll just jump into the big headline first. So we mentioned. Screenwriter, filmmaker, creative producer. The latest project we have you wearing the shirt. Yeah, so yeah. We've got some stuff in the background. We're in uh, yeah, absolutely in your studio space here. Yeah, um, which you know well because you know we were hubbed here mm-hmm. um, um, in the studio house um, for the shoot. Well, the first two two days of the shoot, anyway, mm-hmm. and we can get to that. But yeah, so that was um, as but, you know, and, and again, I have to give you credit for script supervision on that day i don't know what we would have done without you so mm-hmm. just like yeah, thank a you. very 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 critical role and uh, you you definitely showed your stuff right away but we can get to that as well sure so yeah the film um what's it called it is called from under the bridge and then we've given it um a tag <clears throat> or put an additional line because of <laughs> trademarking mm. because from under the bridge um, there's a similar title uh, with a CBS um, TV film or something, so we, we had to give it something extra, but we'll show it. Um, to From Under the Bridge, When Bullies Become Trolls, and um, it's inspired by real events, and we now officially have above the direct reference for mm. the real event portion of, or, or the, the synopsis, uh, the Megan Mai Foundation, which uh, we should definitely mention. So. Yeah. Do you want me to start from the very beginning? Or? So, sure. Yeah, because the a big, a big, like even when the, when I was being pitched a, a, a crew position on the, on the production, I, I remember. Connie, right? Yeah, Connie. Shout out to Connie. Amazing. Um, the, a part of it was the message of the story was a part of like why you want to work on yeah. the film. Yeah. And, uh. The fact that it was inspired by true events, I never really, I don't think I ever asked about what the true events were because I got to see the script and I got to see the story about what, oh, ins- yeah. what was inspired. But yeah, we can right. talk about what got this ball rolling in the first place. Yeah, it's great. So it's a, it, cause it's a really in-depth story and we love storytelling, right? So, yes. um, so this all began for me. Oh, uh-huh. I just hit the mic there. <laughs> For me, it um, started back in 2008, but the real, real story started in 2006. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was in Detroit at the time, and um, I'd already sold um, a screenplay um, prior to this, so I already felt like I was good enough oh, as a, I, I had the right to, to continue mm-hmm. writing and do more I think mm-hmm. I felt like I'd proved myself but my friend Ryan came forward and said hey do you want to do the 48 hour film festival and do you know do you know the I've, setup for this festival I've heard of such a festival 
I mean, I'm sure there's different variations of the formatting, but okay, the 48 okay. hour in general. You yeah, have... nationwide. So, so okay. ba basically, you you get to talk about it beforehand, but on the Friday evening, basically, you get you go meet with everybody else in a big hall, and um, you go draw. And this is where it um, hurt, hurt me. Mm. You draw your genre, mm. right? And I had these mini scripts, and, and from under the bridge, it was called Placebook at the time, and we can talk about that too, why that changed. But um, I got some scripts written, several, that were sort of drafted out in good shape, right? In, pre in preparation for the festival. Right, which is kind of like... You're supposed I, to I've, heard, I've heard of that technique. It's you a little cheaty-cheaty, but... Yeah, it is. It's like, yeah, okay. And so my friend Ryan Mulvaney, who was uh, an editor at a, at a company called Forest Post, I think, at the time, um, he was kind of like, he was going to direct it, uh, be the primary director. We were going to produce it together, and I was going to write it. And uh, so he went up on that night, and he pulled the, the genre mm -hmm. out, and I could see him from across the room. He went up by himself. I could see him from across the room smile, which meant my work that I'd done in preparation meant nothing because he wanted comedy. Mm. He so wanted comedy. And I wanted like something gripping the drama. I wanted to do this true story, right? And so um, so he smiled and I'm like, ah, not only did it mean I couldn't use any stuff, it meant I was going to be at his house writing through the night. And then I was also going to be on set the next day. So I was going to be the one without any sleep, mm. right? So, mm -hmm. so, um, so to end that, so I wrote through the night, we, we did a little film called Skill Crane, which which won the audience vote. It was the winner for um, for the festival, um, the audience favorite, basically. Yeah, nice. it, was, it was called The Audience Congrats. Choice. Yeah, it was, it was great. Before we move on from that, I've yeah. never done a 48-hour film fest mm. before. Yeah. I am curious, because like I said, I have heard of, of people kind of pre-developing these story structures yeah, that you can yeah. kind of jam pack what you what you end up drawing into right, that. Right. Did you? So just to clarify, you jump. You have your preset team already prepped. Yeah. So you, so you know who you're going to be working with in whatever capacity. That's true. That's right. That's and right. then. And it's a small. small so team. how much are you coming up with on the over the weekend? Like how much? How, how much are they giving you? Is it just the genre that gets pulled, or do they also give you like props? Good and, question. No, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, there is. You had to include. Um, you had to include a prop. It was a book, and <laughs> a specific book. No, you just had to. You, okay. you just had to do a book, and so Ryan had this fantastic idea. And ours mm -hmm. was he um, created um, skill cranes for dummies, right? Okay. Which was great, and it was like it was uh, the in a bowling alley where the skill cranes were. The employee, um, um, a very humble employee. He stepped aside and he told you know this 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 addict that he'd won all these toys and they were sitting behind him and he basically says um, you know maybe you want me to, to to help you out or you can buy my book and he threw the book mm. down and it was skill crane for dummies so that was the prop we also had to include um, a line about um, one of the characters had to be a painter so um, our main character his best his best friend. Um, they were in sort of a, a, a sort of an argument, and he said, "At least I don't paint white lines on the street for a living," you know. So mm. that was our painter okay. thing, and there was a third thing too, and I can't remember what that was. But so there were three things total. But you're right. Yeah. yeah. So All you right. get these these things. We had scouted already locations and mm. made agreements. We got um, fabulous response from a movie theater that had skill cranes in that let us shoot in their lobby. Which was unbelievable for us. Um, what's a, what's a skill crane? I'm confused. <laughs> After all of it, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, of course. So, right, okay, <laughs> Just like, okay. So, um, well, I, was you know, I was trusting I could piece it together as you're talking, but I it don't was remember, not. Like at the time, like I didn't even know. Like, okay, we call it like there was a line in the movie that refers to it as grabby claws because nobody knows how to. Oh, gotcha. But it's these machines, like we, in arcades and stuff, where you have a little. Yeah. You know, the crane comes down and you grab grab a toy yeah, out of it, you know, like put in a couple the, of quarters. The, the aliens and Toy Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's the skill crane. Okay. And, and the story was about this this lonely fellow that's just, 
he wants to he he loves these things mm -hmm. it's his passion but he's terrible at it right right you know and and it's caused him problems in his relationship his girlfriend's left him you know there, there's a line in there where it said that he operated you know he he operated cranes all over the city and you know she's thinking hard hats mm. and wrecking balls and yeah, yeah. and i but the, the story is it's it's really it's sweet because this girl his then ex um had said that she liked a bear in one of the machines and so he'd been mm. he'd been going all over the place trying to win this bear right and so this is the transition of the story that he's a little bit misunderstood character you know and at the end you know she realizes that it's actually from the goodness of his heart and is a sweet guy and they connect at the very end which is at the machine which is nice oh, but yeah. it's a very curious and, and the and the actor paul uh elia um he was just on a is it covert steve covert he was just on a show yeah he just posted something on instagram but he he walked in at the last minute of the auditions and i was pissed mm. i was so we were packing up you know we, we were at a local school i think or, or hall and we'd gone through all the auditions and he walks in he'd just taken his what's the the lawyer test um something sat else that else that sounds LSAT. right he'd just taken that test and walked in at the very end and i'm like you know what whatever and like and, and then he he um read our uh, 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 um, script um, portion there, the side, and um, nailed it. He was definitely, he was absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And the perfect person for the role, naturally funny. Um, and he, he made, definitely helped make the movie, or what a little film, what it was. But anyway, so um, yeah, skill crane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, so that's that one. So okay, so um, so the the concept sure. is you get the genre, you um, you you've scouted locations. So we had the the movie theater um, lobby, and we also had the bowling alley, local bowling alley, which was again had it was so pinnacle for us to get that the the, the um, something Hartford Lane, Hartfield Lanes in Berkeley, Michigan, because. It gave this feel for the film, you know, and they yeah. were super nice as well. And everything was free, everything was free right? So everything yeah. had to be done at no cost. You couldn't spend any money. Yeah, right? It sounds like some good production value for sure. Yeah. That sounds nice. Yeah. It's just, and again, it's, I think it's how you talk with people about, you know, how you, how you present yourself and, and a smile on your face, you know, and going in and, and sort of almost a plea within your smile right, <laughs> to get to try and get sure, help. sure. And plus, you're not in Los Angeles, right. so that's helpful too. Yeah, don't we know it? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that was that. So. Um, and this was kind of. I guess we got into that because this was um, early collaborations with someone that helped develop mm. this. Is that how we jumped into that? Or right. So yeah. there's there's. I mean, there's so many. We 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 it, we need a day. <laughs> Honestly, because why this? There, there's a crossover into this. Yeah. Wow, I don't gonna. I'm gonna feel it coming through. I'm gonna tear up now. All right. So um, before you jump in, hey, we do have some mm, drinks here. Yeah, McCallum provided. <laughs> McCallum. Yeah, absolutely. So let's cheers to that. Yeah, cheers. Cheers to to, to film and and, and uh, uh, from, creating. Up, from under the bridge. Yeah. Uh, yeah, from, yeah, from under the bridge. Cheers. So I'll be sipping <clears throat> at this. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna knock your knock your ability to talk out. Little so, sips, little sips, little sips. That was too much. But all right, so, you can give me a shot glass if you want. It's all good. And so it began in two thousand and eight when I wrote the initial draft mm -hmm. for the story. The episode of the 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 occurrence, as I said, happened in two thousand and six, where our girl Megan Maya um, was being mm. bullied by um, a classmate right do you want me to get into this whole story no yeah go for it okay so why this is and you're like okay kids get bullied a lot why like what makes this story above and beyond what you're normally used yeah, to yeah because right? there I guess what you're referring to there is there is a classic as a writer there's a difference between, or like in film, there's, li there's real life and then there's yeah. drama in 
And it's kind of, it feels weird to take something that's obviously dramatic and yeah, it's like, yeah. well, that's not dramatic for a film because it's been done either so many times yeah, or yeah. you've seen it before. So how do, so does that, so trying to figure out on, on the direction to tackle this story and make it interesting in a new way. Is, yeah, right. Yeah, is that's that a really good point. Mm -hmm. uh, also, as, as, it, as we rolled into turning it into the film, which we'll talk about when that decision was made, I also got scared because Megan's mom knew nothing about it at that point. And mm -hmm. I'm like very close to the story. So now I'm thinking, am I going to be able to actually, we're making it, am I actually going to be able to release this? Mm. And I knew that I'd be able to put the film out there, but what would I be able to say? Would I be able to say based on a true story? Um, and I looked into this legally mm -hmm. and it's such a gray zone, right? What words you can use and then mm. what expectations you can have circling back to you and so on. Um, so yeah, so when I was right, I wanted it to, to, to be as close as possible because the story already was unbelievable. It was like, just, I mean, you know the story. I mean, you know the story. The, yeah. the, the synopsis is mm -hmm. that a girl, a girl is being bullied by her classmates. Um, Along comes this guy, teenage boy online, uh, attractive fellow, um, becomes a bright spark in her life. They engage with each other. It's nice. She's attracted to him. He's got, he looks great. Never met him, of course. And it's not him. Mm -hmm. and, you, and like you might think then, okay, it's the bullies. It's not even the bullies. It's one of the bullies' parents that create this fake profile to gain... Megan's trust, or in our case, Claire, mm -hmm. in the story. Uh, and then once they got what they need out of that online fake relationship, they 180 degree the um, profile to bully her instead. So they go from, imagine this girl goes from making uh, this friend and, and somebody she's attracted to, like this teenage boy, this this special. Yeah, it's your one bright spot in, right. in your day that you, right. either you're looking forward to. And, yeah, yeah. and, and um, all of a sudden, for no reason at all, that one person decides that they're going to antagonize you and bully you. It's like, you could have, what? You, you could have been what the heck is going on? What did I do? Mm -hmm. Right? And the short, the, 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 the conclusion of that is that they got so awful and mean through this profile and bullied her, cyberbullying, cyberbullied her mm -hmm. to the point where on that particular night it was so intense and the line was, um, the world would be better off without you, mm. right? And then uh, Megan um, took her own life, you know, and just absolutely devastating. So when we get back to then, okay, so that's the, the nucleus of the story, right? What I wanted to do to expand on that was I wanted also a male character. This was all girls, I believe. Um, and I wanted to have diversity in, in, in um, we're having male and female um, as part of this. Mm. And so as you know, in our story, we have a male bully and um, a female bully, teenagers. Um, that also had their own stories. And this was important to me too. Mm -hmm. And I didn't necessarily plan on giving these subplots. They just all came together. And like, because of the bully, I believe that most bullying is cause and effect or a water, waterfall effect where the person that's bullying, they don't, they're not born bullies, right? This is something you come to be. It's like, or, there may be chemical imbalance in, 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 our, in certain individuals, but still most bullying, I think, is a result of a circumstance or guidance or lack mm -hmm. of guidance, mm -hmm. I should say. So in our story, as you know, we've got um, Kyle, who's our lead bully, if you like, played by Luke um, Clopton, and that was phenomenal. What an amazing actor Luke is. He just... Oh, it says I get chills because I think back <laughs> to the live auditions. Oh, yeah. And we were in a park because COVID. And so we were outside and we had, we had them teamed up in, in different trios of, of Claire, who's our okay. victim, 
uh, Stacy. Kind of like a, a, a little bit of a chemistry test. Yes, chemistry mm -hmm. test. Yeah, good. Yeah, chemistry test. And we rotated them through. And we had uh, Julia James was going for Claire. She was great as well. She ended up being the understudy that we paid for just, just in case. So Piper was outstanding, of course, Piper Reese in the lead of Claire. But we had, um, so Luke was one of them. And when he came in and he did his live audition for Kyle the Bully, he was just full energy on like, oh my God. It's like, you know, came in like fierce and, and shouting, and he was the only one that had done that. Mm. And he's this really nice, you know, Luke, he's mm -hmm. this really sweet, yeah, nice he's guy. great, he's great to work with. He wants with. to give you a hug, and, uh, <laughs> and like he comes in and, like, you know, that's a brilliant actor that just went, goes from this mm -hmm. almost quiet personality, you know, it's like you can't tell this is in him to exploding into like shock the heck out of Connie and I. And, um, he just at that point we knew okay you've you've got this so we have Kyle and we wanted to in in the script why was Kyle this way right mm -hmm. I wanted to to play with this because it's reality you know you know you you go you meet kids at school when you're younger and they're mean and you're like what and, and I learned that some of these kids they had a really crap home life you know that they the, the maybe not didn't live in the best area or they didn't have the, the best association of friends or like lots of reasons why they could be. So anyway. Right. So Kyle, I believe in the story, his older brother, Stephen, um, had trickled down abuse to Kyle. And the reason that Stephen has this issue is because their father was also an abusive uh, bullying personality mm -hmm. and Stephen is absorbing most of it protecting his younger brother but can only take so much and so then will explode and lash out onto Kyle on occasion and um I just I just saw a movie actually like this what's the Jonah Hill directed movie where mm. they they have um the 80s is it the 90s the 90s, the 90s. Uh, mid the mid, mid 90s, mid -90s. Yeah. they have like this Call it that this um, older brother is bullying the, the kid. More. Anyway, um, so yeah, so so Stephen shielding this abuse from their father, and then but can't can only take some marching in. So we have this trickle down yeah. effect. We have um, water, the waterfall effect there. Mm. Then on the other hand, on the on our female bully Stacy, and she, it's her mother that creates the profile in the Nas story. It's um. um it's Julie, played by uh, Rachel Alec, who again, is, uh, unreal. Um, so she's just like, we have a backstory in there that I don't want to tell because our backstory is like in, it could be in the mm -hmm. feature version of mm -hmm. this could be, um, between the families. But um, she's the one that creates the profile. And she's just, she's an alcoholic, you know, she's, um, just not got a lot going on in her life, so she, and she's abusive to to um, her daughter in a, a verbal way. It's more of a verbal abuse rather than a physical abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, calling her names like slut, and you know, just like not, just not the best yeah. guidance again, right? And so, and she's actually Stacy's fearful of her mother. Anyway, so all of these side mm -hmm. stories, yes, that are happening, and and Claire's lost her mother too in the story. So there's yeah. And it just all fell into place to where we get this truly amazing, um, deep story with a lot going on, but not overwhelming the, the film itself, right? You've got these things that just, you know, naturally come into place. The, the hardest part that we're having right now in post yes. is getting it, as always, shortened down to 15 minutes. All right. What what's uh, what's so I guess plenty to talk about there. <laughs> right, I know, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. As far as the posting you just mentioned there, so it was a two day production that turned into four day production. Yeah. And then now in post, you have how? What was like the original rough cut 
and what are you trying to what are you trying to bring it down to? Yeah, that's I mean, great. Down to down to fifteen from. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fifteen, including title credits, because um, cans. And that's for yeah, it's for a festival. Right? Yeah, it's very and very important because um, we do we, we believe the strength of this film. It's it's definitely got high caliber. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the so the first cut, excuse me, was um, I think just over eighteen minutes without credits. Mm. Right. And uh, Phil McLaughlin, again, amazing editor, has been on Away with uh, Hilary Swank and is on um, the the Walking Dead series on, on the AMC, uh, Fear of the Walking Dead. He's just an incredible editor and a great, great guy. I know, right? <laughs> and a great friend. Now when he's here. <laughs> and he's working, he's working on this at nice. no cost. Mm. So we got this talented, exceptional editor helping us. And so he, did, he and uh, Nick as well, um, uh, so a friend of his, did the first edit mm -hmm. over 18 minutes. And the second one just came in and that was 20 because we did pickup shots. Mm -hmm. So we had two days of the original shoot. Um, and we know we had problems there. And then um, another two days, right, which yeah, pretty yeah. much I paid for. And then pickups. Right, you weren't there for. That. I was not you there for pickups. Pick pickups were necessary. They added definitely. There's Claire walking down the street, Stacy approaching the house, mm -hmm. um, relevant shots. And I look at it now, and I'm like, "How are we going to do that? How are we going to get this down to 15 minutes?" So, because I'm, I'm assuming, or how, what was your a classic initial reaction from a from a director watching a, a first cut is like oh my gosh mm. this is crap because <laughs> because right. you've had all this time to think it over and like this is you know you've been sitting with it for so long especially for you yeah yeah that you're like whoa this is what we came out with and then there's like this worry but for you it was more it, that was not the case i was um, That's what it sounds like i think there's lots of reasons for that first of all i knew i knew what i knew the vision Mm -hmm. And I think that I was very vocal about how I saw things and how I want every, like even on set, you notice, I'm very, I was very particular about how things should be and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the scenes and the, the angles and the views. And so, and that all got put into place. And then I talked to Phil directly about some of this stuff and I did a, a very um, in-depth mm. storyboard. I put the storyboard together in, in PowerPoint that had, a lot of information. Yes, so yeah, so you had you were you were prefacing a lot for your editor ahead of time too. So you weren't you weren't really surprised you weren't surprised with what you're getting because you're like this is what I want to get. Yeah. So you laid it out nice and right. Yeah. And, and Phil had the script as well. And, okay. and Phil and I. Um, and the script supervisor notes hopefully. <laughs> oh yes, yes, no, absolutely. <laughs> even before that, yes, and your notes. Um, even before that, he had the original script to go yeah, through, yeah. and we talked about the vision, and um, because I'd already had it played, the whole thing had pretty much played out in my head. I knew what locations are. I knew I wanted an Irish-style pub. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, thank goodness for O'Malley's. So, Sylvia, you were there, Sylvia, <laughs> yeah. where they shot um, American Sniper with Bradley Cooper. Oh, really? I'm like, we're never going to get, we're never, like, this will be a miracle, but I'm like, we'll go in again like we did before, mm -hmm. with a smile, and I eat there, like, I go to this place, right, I, like, it's my favorite pub in Seal Beach, and so, um, go in there and ask politely and nicely to, to the manager, and he was just so cool about it, and Brit as well, which doesn't hurt, Yeah. and um, yeah, so O'Malley's gave us that, so I knew that I wanted an Irish pub. I knew that I wanted it in Seal Beach. I, I like. I didn't. Mm. I just wanted this to be local, because this town deserves that, it, and it's got great locations. the The grass outside here was a perfect for uh, setting for for our uh, park scene, and then and then we had to like try and find houses. And in retrospect, what I wish I'd done now is just start it at home. So even though I would probably never do it again, I would I would not recommend using your own place <laughs> for filming mm -hmm. because things get broken, things happen, you know. I mean, but I wish I'd started there in retrospect because we had the second shoot. Yeah. Right? So, so I, I guess I guess maybe let's back up a little bit. I know because we're <laughs> so much. Right? All right. So. 
uh, I guess for reclarification too on on the pro producer side, like you said, you've you've the forty eight hour film festival experience that you had. I'm not sure. <laughs> pro, what there's a lot that went on in bef in between. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that that right. we can get to, but um, this what is? Am I correct? This is the first project you've been a part of to to create in a while yeah or, no, or, absolutely so so i always think about mm -hmm. especially when it's like all right we want to do this over a weekend like the initial plan was one weekend two days and what was what was the approach you were going <laughs> for initially like what was the thought process for yeah. for those that you know want to do it themselves yeah, this is yeah. Potentially some maybe what not to do's. I don't know. Like, no, it's yeah. very good. It's very good. So, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's how? Just Cody, you know, Cody is like everybody's looking at me like, <laughs> okay, you well, and you're right. No, it's fine. It happens. You because you have a, it's about money. It's about budget, right? In the end, yeah. and you know this, right? You've got. We were so. So you crowdfunded. Crowdfunded, and we had investors, which yeah. included um, an A-list celebrity who I can't mention, I can mm -hmm. tell you that that's very... Who is it? I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know, so, I can tell you, I can tell you after. So, okay, you have a budget, which is great. That's a great place. That helps frame all the decisions, is yeah. like yeah. from what, how I'm thinking about it. It's like, all right, cool, we have something to work with, whatever it may be. And then, so you had all that lined up before you were getting everything set up, right? Or was it a concurrent Ooh, no. thing? no, it was concurrent. Here's... Here's what I did know. Mm -hmm. Whatever the gap was, I believed in it so much I was going to pay for it. And I ended up putting $10,000 plus in myself mm -hmm. into this film. And it's still going. Um, but I believe in it. So like we, we did 12 crowdfunded um, through Seed and Spark. Um, we did equivalent in investments um, from a small investment group, which includes studio executives, um, some people that were passionate about it, um, close to me, and then so about I think it's five or six um, people there. Sure. Half and half. Mm -hmm. They did about 15, 12, my 10 plus. So, so um, yeah. So it was it was parallel. Um, because I knew that I would mm -hmm. bridge the gap, no problem. Because, and this is I think we should talk here why it started. I suppose because once the decision of decision was made, personally, I'm somebody that when I say when when I say let's go, it will get done, and that's yeah. from, from my whole life through mm -hmm. my previous career life and everything else. Um, it gets done. So we had the COVID situation. Yeah. So, so it's just about getting over that hurdle initially and deciding to do yeah. it is the yeah. And I was literally sitting here and I was slowed down on the on the on the T V series um, work because COVID was hitting Slow, it slowed everything down. Yeah. Slowed everything down. Like the zoom like it was ma it was around April, end of April, May time when this was happening. Mm -hmm. And and I was flying out to New York to meet with the studio on the 17th, I was scheduled to go on the 19th of March, I think it was a Friday, for um, a review and contract sign. And on the 17th, New York just shut down. Mm. And so my flight, it was in, it was, the meeting was in New York. And um, so everything got canceled, my flight got, like everything just, just went down. And everybody was in chaos, so nobody, like nobody was working. I was already sort of, I was on point on the game. I was a little ahead of the game in the structuring the, the series. Um, and so I'm like, I'm kind of like not twiddling my thumbs, but because then we mm. go into homeschooling with, with London and, you know, and there was plenty going on. But as far as creating goes, it's like, oh my God, no, I can't just stop. It was like, I just, this isn't my my life now that's when, that's when you're at home kind of itching <laughs> yeah it's like what can i do so you know i'm just browsing through the old i'm like reminiscing back in time right yeah like skill crane i look at that and I, you know i'm looking at um all the drafts and then i saw a place book in there mm. and i'm like open it up and then i start reading it. i'm like one is and i don't want to sound conceited but it's like this is so good and it's still 
You know, like as a writer, right? And mm -hmm. you can probably get this. Sure. You're never happy with stuff you've written in the past, right? Uh, or you, sure, a lot sure, of things sure. you think you can improve upon just because Yeah, of, you've grown a lot, there's a lot of experience you've right. gained in the meantime, so yeah, right. yeah, I know the feeling. So I'd like, there are only, only a few pieces, whether it's poetry, there's a, there's a few pieces of poetry that I still think are good that I've written, and pieces, and there are only a small batch of things that I've written in the past, and especially yeah. in that time period. Yeah. Where I still think they hold weight. Yeah. And I read this and I'm just like, it moved me to tears again reading, reading the script. And I'm like, we're doing it. I'm like, I'm, we're going to do it. And then I just started, and right then I just started the whole process. And I didn't know, like, you know, I started reaching out to, to who I did know, you know, which was a small group mm -hmm. in, the, in the area, because Seal Beach and not in LA. Just the, the peeps that I did know. You know, there's a, a friend of mine called Tara. She's she's great. She's done some stuff. And Phil, obviously. So, well, I guess to, again, I like to think about potentially people listening that mm. are like, I want to do one too. What what are you searching for on these initial phone right. calls? What, what what are you saying on them? What's the... Uh... Two things. And this is, this is, this is great. I, and I knew... I needed to get a producer because good producers, and this is where I'm going to give um, credit to CJ again because she was, couldn't have done this without her, no doubt. A producer to run, to help run mm -hmm. the show, or at least co run the show. Yeah. And a DP, right? DP, because I'm not, I think. I think I have vision and I think I have imagination, vision, I can write the script, I know these things. I also believe that I can direct and I think that that went okay, although there were you know, a couple of you know, things that we learned along the way as more of a producer, not a, as a director, okay. but more of a producer. Yeah. But I needed a producer. And I needed a, a good DP. So those are the initial conversations. You're like, hey, this is going to happen. Yeah. Do you want do either A, do you want to produce, or B, do you know somebody who might be able to produce? Or what was that? Or so production was, was secondary. And I actually knew I had to focus on it, but I was focused on mm -hmm. the DP first. So I, I talked to Phil. And okay. I, I talked to actually a few people. There's another friend of mine called Tom that I worked with that was in production. He did a, a film on Amazon Prime. It was pretty good. Tom Ebert. And um, I called him. <laughs> I remember. Did you love this? He said, what's, he says, what's the budget? And at that point, hmm. I just, I laugh now because I didn't even thought about it since. I said five thing. grand. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, and I think, I think in some way I thought that that was believable, right? Yeah. And I, I quickly, and he's just like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, for for this specific project, yeah. Right, it was like yeah. I'm like really thought that I was going to get a lot of like in kind donations and stuff yeah, like help. that. Help, like, like yeah, ambitious help. And we, I set up on on the website, you know, all of the to, to, to I wanted anybody to submit because Paul Elia back on Skill Crane was just a walking guy who'd just done his LSAT. Right, right. And it was raw. T I believe in raw talent. I believe that. That everybody deserves a chance, one hundred percent, right? So I, that's why everybody. When we had thousands of entries, uh, submissions, and then we reviewed every one of them, we're really proud of that because anybody can be. The, I think the, the the more you can review, mm -hmm. the better opportunity you have for funding. And that's specifically for the actor side. Is is that what you're referring to, or are you talking about the, the DP? everything? Okay. The more you can evaluate, the better the pool. It's like you know, our composers. This is this may be surprising to you and maybe people who are listening. Of all the submissions we had through the website, mm -hmm. the most submissions we had were for composer. Mm -hmm. I mean, for for um, for um, roles um, outside of actors. Right, I mean, right, actors right. Was the most. Sure, but for the composer, composers because they were global. Mm. So they were like people don't like would have got hold of the website. 
there were so many composers from Russia, Australia, England, uh, like Africa, all over the world. And yeah. we ended up, um, we came down, I don't know where we're on a tangent here. Sure. I don't, I don't, but every, the point is here is every role is important. Yeah. I, right? I, 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 one the film's only as good as the worst. Because they kind of, I guess, funny you should bring it up, but... <laughs> I just recorded another episode recently that hasn't, it's coming out, this, whatever, it'll be out. The last episode was with the composer. Um, oh, right, great. So hearing about, uh, I don't know, like her tactics on getting, getting composer, for me, let's say when I'm, when I'm in the director chair, I always have a hard time with that, with, with that side of things. So <laughs> I don't know how to, communicating with composer is still like a work in progress yeah. for me. Yeah. How, how are you, when you have that many options for a composer, how did you work through deciding on who you wanted? How, I, did you have uh, as clear a vision on the, on the score as, as everything else? It's a really good topic and it's also one of the learning curves, right? So, um, the way we started, right? You, you, you wanted no cost or low cost. And we had already a great musician in Justin Bush and Heidi Merrill who did their two main songs. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Born to Fly and I Can't Hold On. And I Can't Hold On is, represents this story very, it's so emotionally mm -hmm. moving and, and depressing. So I, um, I talked to Justin, I said, Justin, who, who is a phenomenal musician, do you have any recommendations? And there was somebody that he worked with um, that did strings and synth and, and mm -hmm. other, and mm -hmm. said, hey, this kid's a, it's a young kid, right? He's a, he's a genius in what he does. Um, I think we give him a shot. And um, I was on board with that. I'm like, okay. Um, and I knew what I wanted. I wanted somebody to, to push the limit. So, to, so I, I really appreciate the scores of um, uh, Facebook with um, uh, social, Trent, the, Trent Reznor. The social network? Yeah, social network. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, social network. And um, also Gone Girl. I mean, some of these, mm -hmm. there are some great simple scores. I love the sound of the social network. And I wanted somebody just to like, to not be afraid. What I, what I didn't, properly value was the, the 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 experience on the feel of the roller coaster like aligning to mm -hmm. what's happening mm -hmm. right and unfortunately um our first composer the, the, this kid who who again this young young man who still was is an exceptional talent i don't think had the experience and it fell off yeah, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. There was yeah. a disconnect, and I let it go a couple of rounds, and mm -hmm. then this is when you have to produce and direct, right? And you get some tough calls. I had to, in a moment, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to make a change. Something you don't ever want to do for, for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's scary, right? You like you go back to, to zero, you have nothing, and then I've yeah. got to like... so. I, I let him know and I said, I'm sorry, um, we have to go a different direction. But again, we're still early on in the game, we've only got mm -hmm. a rough cut. And so I took all of these submissions and I started evaluating them one by one, going to their profiles. You know, and Connie had got, the, and I, I laugh now because this person who we selected had contacted us numerous times. And Connie mm. had said, hey, have you seen this guy, Alexander? Arts in his name, he's a fantastic guy. And, um, and then she said again, have you got back to this? I'm like, I, like, I sent an email to him. Like, you know, I'm like, but now we needed somebody, mm -hmm. right? I'm like, oh my gosh, and we're gonna have to pay. I'm like, okay, it's another, it's gonna be another, however much, I yeah, X say, amount, much yeah. X amount out of my pocket, it's mm -hmm. gonna be my pocket. So I look, so you can imagine, right, you go through, oh, and everybody's got a link, and you go to them, and some are good, and then mm -hmm. I set up 10 out of, <laughs> like, 100 sure, sure. composers. And, 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 I, and I, I'm sure going through, going through the process with, the, with, a young, with a young guy that you ended up 
going a different direction from. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, did that help clarify? Now, when you're listening, you're a little bit more clear on what you're listening yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. I wanted ex- I wanted it experience, mm-hmm. and, but still with edging. I either, and there were a couple of, there were a couple of parts, or a couple yeah. of, of personality types. Yeah. There was classical, and it came down to, in the end, somebody that was, oh, it's from Austria. Um, that I was talking with, and he was so good. And Justin, my mm-hmm. friend, my close friend, and and the songwriter, said, "This is the guy." Because I at the end I sent him like, "This is who I'm." Who I'm oh right, 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 right. And Alexander, who was just different, right, edgy, like had, did a different different technique. And Justin's like, "You should go with the guy from Austria." And I loved him as well. Like he, like I, I, you know, will probably. You'll, you'll keep him in mind. Yeah. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And and he was so, and he sent me a Christmas note, and like just a very stand-up fellow, <laughs> and I connected with as well. So I and I was in Denver at the time. I remember this is when I had to make the decision. Um, I was doing a shoot in Denver, and um, I was sitting there in the, in the hotel room. Late at night, and I'm like, okay, I've got, I need, I've promised I make a selection at this point. Who am I? And it was a Friday night, and I said, I'd make a decision Friday. And I'm like, my gut says Alexander. And so um, I let everybody else, everybody know. And, and mm-hmm. the Zoom calls went from 10, and I eliminated five right away. Then I had five, a guy from Russia who was, who was great as well, a um, guy from Austria, England, mm. and America, two from America. And Alexander's here, and I thought, I just feel it with him. And then we got talking more, and like we agreed on a rate, which was acceptable, and it was cool we, we, that we got to that so quickly. And then I start, I follow him now, and social, and like, mm. I see more of his person. I'm like, I definitely mm. for this made the right decision and now he just wants to get started and you know like yeah, we need yeah. to give him a closed picture locked picture in yeah. order for him to to do his thing but yeah so that's a lesson learned experience in composition understanding of flow and feel and the roller coaster of emotion imperative that you have that yeah and that's kind of, that's kind of a weird thing too because that's the tough thing about the art side is just it's it, it's yeah. like it's like just be good <laughs> and right. it's like wait but right so but there's that element of like because you're trying to as an artist you're just trying to be your best self and, and present yeah present the art but um it is difficult to uh really know what it is you're like you, you don't really know it until you see it you don't know it until you hear it there's that weird element of right of right of random uh-huh. picking till say like, oh no this is what I really look this is this is the good fit and this is why I think you know when you're born to to be doing what you're doing right because um, there's this this inherent gift theory or hmm. installation into your DNA of what you're good at right so <laughs> and this that you can reference this in my past career as well you can like I always say this about being born to be able to do something or not. Mm. If you, what we call cutting a section, right? So if you take any object, like a table or, you know, a body, mm-hmm. right, an arm. Sure. Some people can imagine, like, slicing through something and then being able to, to do a 2D drawing of that, mm-hmm. right? So, it, mm-hmm. like, like, coming through and, like, cutting a section through. Some people just don't have the ability, for whatever reason, to vi- envision what it is to cut through something and then draw it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's one of those things. So, so in, when we talk about this in directing and producing, I really believe mm. that what separates a good or great director from someone who's average is this inherent instinct about understanding what you need, what's good, 
before without being the expert and you just have to be like, identify expertise and and how it's all going to fit together right mm -hmm. that's kind of like when you when you do the split you have to kind of see all the pieces and see how it connects yeah and so it's the same thing when you're separating the film you're like here's the visual what sound is going to plant with that and right like all the layers right you know? and 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 to, to be able to like as a director and a producer mm -hmm. understand all of those roles and their relevance and contribution to the overall vision because I think film, mm -hmm. you can have different jobs where you can have mediocre and still get away with, you know, as, as a mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. right? And um, if I'm true, the automotive business is one of those. And this is like, okay. yeah, yeah. You, you, can, you can have mediocre. I think film is, the, is one of the few true um, um, industries where your overall project is truly only as good as your worst aspect of the film mm, mm. because everything is important the compass the score is essential the editing is essential if you get bad editing or mediocre editing and the transitions aren't right or the the vote the dialogue over the transition isn't right mm -hmm. or like the timing is wrong it, the film is terrible or average at best. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, if you have a, a if you have beautiful lighting and great acting, but then the set is Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Everything or, has to be if you want a great film, everything's mm -hmm. gotta be excellent. Yeah. I, right? I like that. I like it's that. The graphic equalizer of of what what you can afford or what you can entice. Mm -hmm. Like everything's gotta be great. And it's like, and you're seeing it now. And the next thing that we're going to have to look at are visual effects, because I need visual effects. Uh, I need a cut on the arm in, mm. for Claire mm -hmm. in, in one of the scenes. I need that to be good. If that looks terrible, then that's going to like fall so, down. So then this, this might bring us back and put us back on track to where we were before. <laughs> right, right. So... With that being said, was that something you knew already? Was that already a belief you had going into the project? Yeah. So then, again, with that being said, now you're in the hunt for, you're like, all right, I'm yeah, making yeah, this. Yeah. This is the budgetary level we're aiming for now, and now you're searching for... Now, okay, so we're we initially jumped on because it was like, I want to shoot this not at my house, is what is what you initially were... Well, what, yeah, yeah. Of the, of the, there was an in-house scene, so I, yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to locate... Were you with us for that? For what? For you scouting? No. No, oh, okay. Uh, the uh, assistant directors. Um, I didn't want to shoot in my own place. I wanted a different feel. And we found we found a great house. And that, was that uh, a, uh, was that, what, I mean, what was the reasoning for that decision? That I wanted a place that could look like two homes. Mm -hmm. And you needed to, because it, because like, because like you said, the fear was, if I'm shooting at my place, stuff's gonna get broken. Like, no, no, no. okay, that wasn't the fear. It was. It was more about time, mm. right? If I could find one location that could act as two houses, then we could be in one spot on that one day and shoot um, without moving equipment from yeah, yeah. location to location. Save, save time. Yeah. yeah, and that was the reason we we and they were great. They were really great, and I don't think they knew, and I didn't know what when you have like 25 to 30 people like trouncing around your house you know mm -hmm. um but they were absolutely fabulous and um so we, and they did they had a house that looked like two houses but then we had to do a little bit of construction in there to to, to create mm -hmm. a door which my personal again personal fame personal friend don warner who i knew from my mm -hmm. past career he came in and knocked up he created two doors <laughs> in this house yeah right? the, the, put, putting up some there. putting up some temporary walls and yeah, stuff. yeah honestly yeah and um but then where that all fell apart was that when we when we had to go back to the location and and then we were in we couldn't afford the original cost and and uh, and we only needed we only needed the 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 one portion of the day to get you know the scenes that we or the the footage that we didn't get mm -hmm. and I, I basically sent in a, a, a like a value that we could pay which was fair but still 
if you're a homeowner, and I understand this wasn't enough to, to, to bring us back in, and I'm just like, okay, then we have to figure this out. So CJ and I looked at mm -hmm. the, um, the film, and so did Phil, the editor. Yeah. Can we, can we fake it, right? And I don't want to, I don't want to almost tell all the tricks to people that might watch it, right? Sure. But this is, this sure. is what you have to do. You have to see if you can fake it and move Yeah, because I guess, I guess from my perspective, what I remember, again, the initial plan was a two-day production. We're going to shoot it all <laughs> over two days. I forget. I, forget. I, I, I was going to look back at the original script and just clarify, but how many pages was the, is this short? It, to be fair, it's 20. 20 page. Yeah, and it's 20 minutes right now. Is it a 20-pager? Yeah, no, okay. it's, yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> so. I, yeah, yeah. All right. I just remember being on location from the script supervisor perspective. I'm there trying to help you out best I can. I'm like, all right, what <laughs> do we need to cover the script? And at least cover this location because you had voice like this location. It's not, this is the, not the simple one to replicate. So like, let's focus here. I think was a discussion we were having. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you were great as well. I, mean, I have to beam because... And I sure. think it's good, like you, it's the unsung hero most of script supervisors, right? Sure. Let's praise script supervisors for a second. It's like all of, <laughs> cause all of a sudden they become your best friend, director's best friend. Is there a point when they're not? Is the question? No, I think um, <laughs> I think people that try and go without them. Mm -hmm. So okay, so learning, learning mm. experience, right? I've heard of people that go without script supervisors, especially writers doing it. I would. It's a must have, must have position. Why do you think some filmmakers uh, consider going without? What's the what's the I thought process? I don't know. Is it maybe because you know when we talk about things that, that you have inherently in you? Are these people that say no to script? Do they run the whole thing in their head? Are they organizational gurus that that have everything in their head expansively to where they know what scenes are? I don't know. Which <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay. I, I my belief is is that script supervisor is a weird position that you don't <laughs> quite know like a goalie. until you have until until you have them in your corner right. and they're there on set like telling you stuff. You're like, right. wait, I didn't even know you did that. Like what <laughs> might might be a thing that's cause It's right, it's like Paul. <laughs> this is you, right? Paul. Hey, I just want to tell you. And it was like, yeah, it's like the tap on, oh boy. But you know you have to listen. It's like if you tap on the shoulder, if you pull aside, it's an important topic and it's always right. Always right, right? That's, that's, the, that's the idea is, yeah, it's uh, got to be very, being that, yeah, I got to be very specific about when I speak up because it, if, if I'm just saying willy-nilly things, like that doesn't matter. <sighs> no, it's, no can, it's good. Yeah, yeah. You right. No, no, it's really important, and you are this role. Because, because right? I've heard some script, some script supervisors have a tendency to speak up on every take, uh, uh, on the on the small stuff. It's like is that right? Like word perfect things. Maybe a word is off. They oh, they, no, okay. they run in and say something. Maybe okay, the hand, okay. the continuity wasn't perfect. But I'm thinking about it because I have the editing experience, and I yeah, have yeah. you know just overall general filmmaking experience and I'm like, all right, is that important to bring up right now based on the circumstances in which we're yeah. in? Yeah. It's like, no, let's prioritize right now. It's about the location. Let's figure out how to get us out of here and get you your edit. And like, is that? Okay. Yeah. And your, the way you handle script supervision is perfect. Thank you. No, cause it's a, you're right. I think, um, you step in, First of all, let's not. I, I, I don't want to bring up the, the specific. Hey, we don't have to. You don't have to name people, yeah. right? But that opening, the, the morning of the first day, where you came in, right? And this is all sure. like fresh. We've got a whole team of people here. Some, some mm -hmm. have worked together before. Some hadn't, right? Yeah. And a classic first day of production. Classic first day, and and um, the, the vision was rolling. You know, we, we were, I get it. You know, we'd, we'd done the first action and we were flowing and it was like we all were, all the rust was getting 
shaved off, you know, and mm -hmm. we, 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 were in, we were in good spirits and I think it was going well. But then there was this DP, um, not scripture, but, but concern, right? Well, it's a, it's a for me, it's a classic. You should, tell, you should talk about this. It's a classic thing that comes up as a script supervisor. Like, I, I almost feel like there's a moment at the beginning, like every first day where I'm there and people don't either, because of course, in indie film, you don't know what experiences people have had before, what script. Because like you said, a lot of, maybe a lot of indie productions don't, they, they go without the script yeah, suit. Yeah. In this, this instance, the DP, from my understanding, had a lot of experience on sets. Mm -hmm. It was like almost like one person crewing it and kind of getting by without the big full, the full right. thing. So yeah, I could right, tell right, 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 that right. my job was attempted to being, you know, there's like, I managed the 180 line as a script supervisor for continuity, just making sure that it's going to cut well and yeah. that yeah. angles are right. <laughs> right. And so it was a 180 issue where it was like the camera should be on this side Ex of the line. Ex yeah, explain what that is. <sighs> you have to. Because so. it's one of those, to be fair, it's one of those things about camera angles that even in directing you, you learn yeah, it's not, along the way. Because it's not technically, it's, it's the nitty grittiness of the specificities that you don't want to be thinking about as a director. You don't right. care on if the 180 line, like you care, but you, it's not what you're thinking What's about. What's the 180 line? Explain. Okay, the 180 line, let's think about, because this is recorded podcast. Yeah. So if we can sit, normally I have to draw an image, like this is how you I know, right? It. right. I, I, I illustrate <laughs> it, cruel, and I'm cruel. like, all right, but as far right now, camera's there and it's shooting us from this from this side of the camera right from this side of us is where the camera is so ideally when you jump in for coverage and get our close-ups you're not so if we if we put a camera over your shoulder looking at me exactly right 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 and then if we're going to get the reverse over my same shoulder side. looking at you it should be over the same side established by the wider yeah, so shot. it wouldn't be over here so it looks weird when you like yeah so so there are times you can break it, and I'm, I'm familiar with when it's okay to jump around. But sometimes if we go over the shoulder that matches this camera, going over the other shoulder of the other person, then when you, when you cut back and forth, eye lines and stuff, I don't know, it's, it's, just, it's weird. It's weird, right? It's, it's a weird, weird, it's a it weird doesn't thing. feel right. So that came up right. on day one right. where I'm like, I'm seeing it very clearly because this is kind of it's all not, I'm looking not for. Not a problem. So I just had to kind of speak up and be like, actually, yep. we're making this really complicated. Yep. The camera goes here. Let's, yep. let's maybe just do that. And we didn't know each other, right? Correct. So we literally hadn't really met, mm -hmm. right? And so on, on the first day of shooting, and we'd done a, a little, little bit of shooting, and we were in this situation, you come out, I got the DP come out, and now we're in a triangulation of, and I, to be fair, mm -hmm. And, and part of me being a director, I, like, I wanted to listen. Because like, the best thing you can do is listen to what people have to say. So DP, and I didn't, I didn't get what the DP was saying. Yeah, so, I, so there's some confusion being spread. Mm -hmm. And that's when I come in to clear yeah. it up. And I'm like, I just didn't understand. I didn't see it the mm -hmm. same way. And I didn't understand. And then you spoke. And like, I immediately, from the, the understanding of the situation... Mm -hmm and you said it's not a problem, I was on board with you. I'm like, I got to have respect for the DP as well. But I'm like, I'm th I had to make a decision at that moment. And oh my gosh, it was the first, what, couple of hours of shooting. Yeah, probably. To say to the DP, listen, I value, and this is where understanding how to talk to people, I think is beneficial. I value your opinion. I don't think that, that this is necessarily, necessarily being a good word, accurate. I think that, Let's just go. I, I think that, that Eddie's got a fair point. I want to go with him, if that's okay with you. Because um, you don't want the DP to walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and then and we moved on. And I think we handled that. Because I did. You were right. Right? Yeah, you were yeah, right. Yeah, I thought you were right. And it's like, oh, my God. It's the first time meeting Eddie. You've come out like... You know, like from the shadows <laughs> the, the, in the movies where the like the, the body drifts in, mm -hmm. like the ghost. Yeah, you know, yeah. they're just like, zzz, mm -hmm. and you're like by the side, you know, just like floated in. Mm -hmm. Hey, <laughs> and there's that tap on the shoulder. 
No, I think you're okay. And you're so, and you don't, you're not conflictive either. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and this is why we talk, I think we talked about yeah, this. Yeah, we've talked way. about it. I just try to plainly present the information, do what right. with it you will. If you right. want to, if you want to go with the DP's option, as long as I said my piece. Yes. kind of like. Which yeah. is what you feel you're responsible. Mm -hmm. And later on, what happened? The DP came forward and said, and said I was right. That's right. And I was like, because it takes a, when, because I understand the DP perspective too, because DPs right. often have to cover that because they're the only person there watching the eye lines and watching the 180. Right, right. So normally they're pretty good about it, but sometimes they, they flump just like anybody else because yeah. that's not their primary objective. And I'm there to catch in case it happens. So I understood that. The DP is looking for so many things. That's an easy thing to let slip. So I'm just... And credit yeah. to the DP, director of photography, mm -hmm. um, for coming forward and saying, you know, that you were correct. Yeah, that's nice. But yeah. it does get into then um, the situation where we had to bring in a new DP. So, um, truth be told, were you here that night? You were here that night. Yeah, that I, was first a, night. I, was a, I was a part of some discussions. You were. So we were like, it was a tough conversation about... <laughs> There were some things that had occurred on that day. One of them was I was, uh, the big one for me was I had been convinced. I had a vision for the bench scene. So our bullies were antagonizing um, our victim on a bench in the park, mm -hmm. which I had selected out on um, the green belt here in Seal, Seal Beach. And it, for me, it was perfect. It was at the end. There was a gazebo area down there. It was, it was an air. It like mm -hmm. felt right. Mm -hmm. it was, it so was it's good, as far as a location to shoot the scene. Yeah. Right. And my DP had suggested we go into the middle just so that we could have two benches so we could work with different light. Yeah. And I was, at the time, I was like, my gut said, you don't need that, really. We've got lighting people. We've got a crew. We can bounce light mm -hmm. or whatever we mm -hmm. need to do. But I, I, I said, okay. And so um, we were literally going to be going all like all over the place and in the middle here. And I didn't like it. That wasn't mm -hmm. what the vision was, right? Mm -hmm. But I accepted it. And then so on the day, I think on the day I said, you know what? No. There were already certain things that were like, we were delayed already. And it was like, of course, the first morning we were already delayed. But I'm like, we're keeping it. I want to keep it here. And I should have just made that call in the, mm -hmm. in the beginning. It's just like, okay, and then we had also one of the sell points for the director of photography was that they could operate the Steadicam. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't accurate, to be fair. So we got to the end of the first day and, um, you know, we got the footage in and then we had to make a decision. Were we going to shoot day two, the Sunday, keeping in mind that we'd already convinced the city of Seal Beach to let us shoot in the summer, which nobody had ever been able to do ever before and on a weekend. So what we got in Seal Beach was the mayor, give, give him credit, um, he lifted the restrictions or helped us with the city mm -hmm. to shoot in the summer, which was not permissible, mm -hmm. and to shoot on a weekend, which was not permissible, right? Um, and so we were gonna have to redo this, oh my gosh get permits again mm -hmm. for all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And lift restrictions. We'd already got lucky once, right? So we were like, oh, that was going through my head on the first day about making a change or because we were talking about not just making a change, but canceling day two, right? We were talking about not filming Sunday. Because I mean, all, all the options are probably going through your head at that oh, point too. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was push forward with what we have bring in somebody new with this super yeah. minimal notice and then and we were contacting uh, new people that night and then supposedly even cancel yeah. day two and, and right and, and so the, the ultimate decision was which I made was to still shoot day two get the footage that we can I wanted to honor the contract it's also about integrity right so much mm -hmm. I wanted to be integral to everybody that signed up to work that day and was I prepared to absorb <laughs> then that cost, yes, to keep everybody that had committed to working on a Sunday, including the DP. So we did. We, we really ran through that day. And then I knew that already at that point we were. Yeah, yeah. So then 
when we talk about now the lessons and yeah, the learning. Sure. So another like don't be afraid to make a change or know when to to be as calm as possible to accept that you're going into another day so that you don't stress everybody out. Because at the end of the day, you start to get the stress level of keeping on schedule, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we should mention here that in film, every scene is important. The schedule, like, you can't get, like, n- there's nothing, you don't put things at the end that aren't important, right? Everything's important. Mm-hmm. So realistically, like, the end is just as important as the beginning, right? Every yeah. scene is relevant. There's no, like... That's, I- that's ideal, <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, for, mm-hmm. you know, like, there's... You, you want every shot, mm-hmm. every scene. And so um, schedule is everything. And this is what makes the AD as well, the assistant director, again, the person on point for schedule as well, crucial. And they're probably the most, the ones that you get the most friction with probably as a director. Because they're on you to say, you need to move on now or you're not going to like, and you, need, and you, you don't have that yeah, it's like It's yet. like you have to be happy with what we just got. Right, <laughs> right. And you're not. Yeah. And so yeah. you're like constantly, it's like, if you stop talking to me, I'm, we had to get another take it, <laughs> right? You know, what mm-hmm. thing. But again, AD, critical, critical position, love them. They're another thing you don't have to worry about is that if you're on pace, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we made a change to Matthew McCarr. Dude, where's my car? Is this, mm. is this, which is which is funny. It makes me laugh every time. Matthew was absolutely brilliant and could operate. He the steady cam. We had a jogging backwards. You know, you know. Remember this um, in the park where we had to jog backwards in front of the actors, keep an equal distance, pull focus. Yeah, it's a things. classic walk and talk. Yeah, um, but they were speed walking. They yeah. Were at, and what we lost in, in the first one was that we had to slow everything down where they were just walking and it mm-hmm. wasn't right. It didn't feel it wasn't right. So Matthew came in and Matthew was was outstanding. He did the second two day DP um, shoot. And he got he got great stuff. Anyway, the point is don't be afraid to make a change. And still expertise expertise is still critical mm-hmm. right and so we had to get dp that knew what it's doing and we interviewed a few again cj and i interviewed a few candidates and we had a one as well that the uh, he, would we have gone with him yes but it didn't feel quite right talking to matthew i knew yeah you gotta yes. gotta go with your gut yeah he was the he was the guy and he did a great job so um rounds that up wow so much <laughs> God. so all right now i don't i don't know um i wasn't sure if there was any other so now you're you're we shot principal photography was mm-hmm. bad we were just talking about it uh back in august is what yeah, you we were did, saying yeah principal was in was in August, I can't remember the exact date, 19th maybe, end of August. So I guess, I don't know, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, which um, I find, I don't know if the correct word is commendable, but I think it's cool. And I don't know where you, where you get it from or what the idea is, but uh, I was curious on, because I've, I've made plenty of short films myself, yeah. So then when I see the kind of push you're giving on this one, I'm like, dang, this is how you really do a short film. <laughs> That's how I see it. I'm like, whoa, yeah. there's, yeah. you know, you've got the hats, you've got the t-shirts, you, you, oh, right. you, you got the face masks because of, because yeah. of COVID times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have, uh, you've got the partnerships with the foundations. Which is huge. Um, <sighs> you're putting, like, you're putting a lot of effort into your poster, you which I do you, myself. You've got you've got soundtracks. You like you're you're putting all this stuff out there. You're letting people know what's going on. You've, you're yeah. you're in the Seal Beach news newsletters. You're, like yeah, all newspaper, this, yeah. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you're getting you're getting blurbs from from uh, like you're sending clips out for yeah. for blurbs from. Um, we've got Voyage LA and we yeah we've uh, and the British press are picking up on it now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so for me thinking about like oh dang this is a great. <laughs> 
observative like whoa this is this is how you like i said this is how you do a short film i'm yeah, not thanks. sure thanks. what where you got this layout from or how how you're how you're going about it and i didn't what <laughs> i really didn't sure i think first of all thank you yeah. because yeah a lot of work has a lot of work has been putting and i think this is where if you have a bucket or a, um, a portfolio of creative skills like i do uh, all the artwork i've done i think um cj um had the um initial uh, design for the new logo mm. which was good and then um, we took it on to become yeah, this logo which is uh, which is outstanding but all of the colors the fonts the photography I knew that um, we had this is this is a great topic of conversation mm -hmm. because you're right so I think about it this is the this is the hype machine this is the yeah. PR that really gets people excited Substance. about first of all getting involved in the project on the mm -hmm. investor side yeah 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 and yeah, yeah. the follow through with making sure people are going to watch it because yes. the film does matter and yeah. we'll, and the intention is for it to make a difference so this is this is a great conversation piece um Oh, it's 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 a combination of things, right? So yes, you're right. You want to. Um, mm -hmm. There's the one side where you believe in your work and you and you want to make it the best representation of that vision as pos as you possibly can. And I understand that not everybody's blessed with a little bit of money to be able to spend on it themselves, or, and you know. And what we had going for us here was. Mm -hmm. Uh, a real story, mm -hmm. I think. A real story is with depth, and then on top of that, um, you know, the depth, sub substance, real story, um, a cause. Mm -hmm. Within all of this, we had all of those things. So we had, um, like, our executive producer when we went on Season Spark, we had a the highest level incentive position, which was I wanted to say several thousand. We had um, a New York lawyer come in, uh, Lucas Ferreira, who's, mm. who's, it seems to me after learning more, he, like he invests in so many different mm. films and a lot with causes. I think that he came on board and went within minutes. I couldn't believe it. It's like we had that, for, I'm like, oh my gosh, we'd like hit our first target like within hours, mm. you know, like, yeah. so, um, when you've got a cause, when you've got a true story, when you've got a good script, let's be real, um, you you get momentum. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's one thing, like good script, true story, good cause, you've got the trifecta there of, mm -hmm. of stuff that you want to drive. Because sometimes I would, I would I, my thought on the good script too is that's a weird yes, but also I think the people investing aren't reading the full script. Not true. Are well, they, they don't, right. No. Um, well, we had studio executives and mm. an A-list actor. And they so had read the full script. They had read the full okay. script. Okay. Because I, I think about when initially a lot of people don't have access to the script. Right. But being able to know it's there and right. pull from that, it kind of inspires. Uh, for You're right. But on a season spot, there was no script. There was yeah. just the, the synopsis. And your word. Right. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. to be honest. Wow. Man, that is a, that's a great point, right? Your word. Yeah, that we're going to do this, and we are. Um, and we're doing it, and it will get completed no matter what. Um, a good example is the, the picture that we have there of, mm -hmm. of where you like invest, right? So in our initial poster, because we didn't have Piper, mm -hmm. Reese, as Claire, the, the, the victim, our lead actor, we didn't have her. So I had to buy a stock photo and I searched through all the stock photos that, that would represent mm -hmm. the vision. And I got, and it was perfect. It really was perfect. Mm. Like, and, oh God, there's so much to it. The car, I wanted it black and white except for the tie. And the tie colors are from my high school in England. Uh, there's all this relevance going on, right? And so I have this, I knew I just wanted to go in an unknown distress in a school uniform, mm -hmm. which you feel, I forget all of this now, 
in a school uniform because I wanted to reach back into my roots and my high school in England where I did performing arts and I fell in love with performing arts, right? It's like, but where there was also mm-hmm. significant bullying going on there. I wanted that in place, so I had the shirt tie, like, and then I saw so I took the stock photo and then I photoshopped and created this image. Right? And so that's where it began. But so anyway, so then we needed to bring in Piper and we did several shoots here with our BT, uh, behind the scenes photographer, Amy, who's exceptional. And I worked with her again on a, a shoot with our sound guy, um, Jose, actually, uh, for, a, for a TV mm. pitch. Um, she, she tried, I tried to get Piper the right way to substitute her in, because I wanted Piper, I wanted the lead mm-hmm. actor in the poster. That's yeah, the whole that, point. That was, yeah. And it just, we took, I think we did it three times trying to get this image on a green screen. Mm-hmm. And I worked 60 hours on this, trying to do the substitution, maybe more, maybe 80, you know, which is a lot. Yeah. It's like two full work weeks on just that substitution of the poster. And it just wasn't coming together right. And I was talking with Piper's dad and we all felt, I need to go hire a photographer, Alan Wiseman. Mm who I hired and we went to LA shot her and this actually we got all of the images that we wanted and scheduled and at the very end we said you know what do some screening you know and that's a chance again chance photo that became now and I think it's incredible Mm -hmm. the image now on the poster of of that desperation that just that moment of intensity right yeah, definitely uh being a part of the project it does i feel it does some of uh yeah yeah and that, and that's um so that's one of those decisions it's mm-hmm. like knowing when something isn't quite mm-hmm. right and you don't want to compromise but on the other side of the scales is like do you have the time and the money to not make the compromise mm-hmm. right and this is where i get to a point where i have a little bit of help in the fact that I'm prepared to spend my own money on making it right you know and um, this was a plus this is probably one of the best decisions we made was to go to the photographer Mm -hmm. you know to Alan and get this picture done because it's now was that a was that a something you had to consider in the beginning and you're like no we can get by with a BTS photographer so you end up coming back to that initial or that's a good that's a good point i figured that i would be able to get <laughs> it's it was just, for me it was mm-hmm. um it was, it was kind of like how hard could it be kind of right thing. <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying not to say that but it's true right yeah, yeah, yeah i'm like yeah it's just a picture of a person that you want to substitute in on a black background i mean but yeah it's everything and yeah. contrast and yeah. hair like it's stuff that i am not a professional at but i know what it looks like mm-hmm. and this this is the this is the thing you know, what the classic one is, and people should know this too, is like, I think the hardest thing to understand mm-hmm. about um, what we do that you're not an expert in is lighting. Mm-hmm. And lighting, I think, was one of the biggest things for me to learn, really. Like, and I did a lot of self-education on, on lighting. Mm-hmm. And s- like, to get to that point of knowing what, what as good, is good, and I can never do it mm-hmm. on set still. Oh my God, it's like, I... I just, you have to trust that they know what they're doing. And um, color correction too, color correction mm-hmm. as well as an art as well. But these things like lighting on a face, like to have, you know, the, the right shadows, right? Yeah. To be high and not low or those sorts of things. Yeah, it's just want to have a good, good light. Yeah, lighting is one thing. Because let's just say as a director, or as, as a filmmaker in general and you're trying to make stuff and you want to understand everything, you, you quickly learn that no matter which, let's say department heads, let's just say, no, no matter <laughs> which, which, which department you're deciding, it's an endless rabbit hole yeah. of information on each <laughs> right. one. So it's like getting the basics down, I guess, is, is a nice. So you can, you can, you can um, what's the word? Uh, you can really be... 
not confident. But... No, appreciate. Yes, yeah, yeah. What others are bringing to the table, because like this is your right. craft. Right. Please do what you do. I cannot do what you do. Right. And I trust you. Yeah, like that whole. And that's the same in mm -hmm. any leadership role. Mm -hmm. Which uh, kind of takes us into what I did before as vice president in design. Yeah, I was wondering how much that's played into how you Hugely. handle yourself as a director and, and yeah. I think, so I've had a lot of feedback from people that were on set, just, just, just to be honest and sure, truthful. Sure, sure. As a sort of first time or direct, uh, primary direct director debut, mm -hmm. that I didn't do so badly or I did okay, right? <laughs> I think I, I got great <laughs> feedback. Okay. And I think... I attribute this a lot to that my roles prior, which I, I this is a, the, the, on one side you look at not starting early enough or not going when you could. I, mean, I guess we could talk about mm -hmm. that as mm -hmm. well. But being a leader um, of a team that was sometimes 30, 40 people and understanding how. Um, to talk to each individual differently. That's one of the best things I can say, is like mm -hmm. quickly identify how you can form a conversational or communication bond with that individual, right? Trying to uh, assess their personality type and, and whatnot quickly. That's one thing. Um, different departments as well. If you're a vice v VP, you have different um, departments, especially in the automotive industry. You know, so, so to clarify, you were, what was your prior position? Okay, so the, when I finally, again, sold the screenplay, but then carried on in mm -hmm. automotive design, I was vice okay. president of design operations at um, Fisker Automotive and then Karma Automotive. I was director at Fisker, but Karma, I was VP. And I had the whole clay sculpting, digital design, um, craftsmanship. Should I um, pull out the props? Yeah, the yeah, props? okay, yeah, that's great. All right, so we have some props. This is, yeah, this I is the paperweight actually wanna. given to me by a member of my staff, Gil, who was a great guy. Um, so if you want to describe it for people listening, too. Yeah. So, um, so let me just put that one there because this is cool. Sure. This is a, this is a speed form um, from back in the the fiscal automotive days and um, the design process it goes from sketch the very beginning is sketch and Henrik Fisker was the sketch artist um, and it's very talented designer mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. from Denmark and uh, he's just a very talented guy and then um, it goes from sketch then you do um, what's called a digital representation of that sketch as well as clay modeling so it's a full-size clay model on top of foam mm. um, based on a digital, what's called a class A surface creation. Like in the computer, you literally create a computer-aided design model of the sketch. Mm -hmm. And then you scan, you, you scan that and then um, turn it into a big clay model, right? You, yeah. uh, and then this is a miniature version of what the clay would be. It's called a speed form. And so this is, again, the light has to reflect it the right way and um, it's a representation of the, of the car. And so you can see how the form is going to be, right? And then this would be something you display at some meeting of some kind and you're like, this is, this or, is or this, what is this specifically? This is to, to, to make sure that the proportion, so you get a smaller version of what the proportions are, mm -hmm. are, are if they're right or not. So... In the automotive world, yeah, I know nothing. You know when, right? Okay, but you know when a car looks good, right? <laughs> sure. Right. So well, here's no. the thing. Inst this is this is the same thing. Instinctively, you look at a car, and you say it's either beautiful or it's average or it's not, right? Um, do you remember the Pontiac Aztec? I am not a car guy. Okay. Okay. So there, in, inside us, we've got an appreciation for proportions and form sure, in, in sure, all sure. types of things. Sure. Right. Vehicles is one. So one of them is like if if the the wheelbase, where the wheels are in representation to the rest of the body, and where certain lines go, or certain if you look at the side profile, 
right? Some things just just feel right, like the flow or how the yeah the yeah. rear window interacts with the roof. You or, can you can base some sort of right. judgment and like, oh, that looks like yeah. a family car. This looks like right. a sports car. Or something says that looks sexy. That's a sensual shape. Mm -hmm. That's that's about automotive design and getting the right width, length, and then the curves and the lines. Everything has to come together just right, mm -hmm. right? And that's what was exceptionally done at this this company um, in Fisker and Karma is the styling. The styling was top notch, and everybody agrees mm -hmm. it's about styling. Okay. So um, you want to put that over there? Yeah, so that's yeah, a speed yeah. form. And then, um, so these departments, so, and where this comes into play now is that, so multiple departments, so multiple disciplines, mm -hmm. multiple fields yeah. right, that we deal with, um, talking to people as individuals. But one of the most important things was not being afraid to hire an expert that knows more than you do, mm -hmm. right? One of the biggest things I learned and knew that I had to, because we're all, if you're a creative person, you have somewhat of an ego, right? You, you think course, that sure. you have yeah, to. I know I do. Right. And you have to, <laughs> right? Because you feel like you're good at what you're doing and you want to, to, to show that. Sure. And I was like, in design, I was the same way. I was like the youngest, when at 27, the youngest manager, youngest director, youngest mm. vice president, always the youngest. Oh, well, congrats. So, well, thank you. <laughs> I knew that, that the ambition was there, mm -hmm. but the, one of the quickest things I could learn for myself was hire somebody that can take your position for sure. Because at the end of the day, you're responsible for delivering and delivering quality, right? So you're only as good again as, as and if you, and a lot of people create gaps. They want to be, they want to have this gap between the people they hire and themselves mm -hmm. for security reasons, insecurity reasons, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It doesn't work. You have, if you want to be excellent yourself, you have to identify those areas. Like you said, that you're not the expert in, that other people have spent valuable time becoming an expert in that area mm -hmm. and can deliver for you as a composition, as a collective. And that's filmmaking. So absolutely, as a vice president, learning at, at, the, at the automotive company, learning all these things and then getting on set, I was so comfortable, absolutely mm. comfortable with having a lot of people around me to, you know, uh, yeah. to help. Yeah, you know? no, I, I, I'm a big fan of those foundations as well, where uh, it does take a lot of effort to overcome thyself and be comfortable with like, because there, there is likely that, that regardless of your, you knowing you're not an expert at it, there is that insecurity still of like I'm walking into a room to talk, yeah, about, to, talk yeah, to the costumes yeah. people yeah, and I have yeah. no idea what I'm talking about. I'm yeah. going to look stupid. I have no, like whatever, like that. Oh, yeah, sure, like, sure. Like, right. So, but then it, it, there's that balance of like acknowledging what you don't know and yeah. then and then overcoming it and having those conversations and they're there to help you like that whole kind of all that all and that listening stuff to and yeah. learning from the best yeah it's the same like my the co-founder of the car company um barney cola who's a really close friend now like mm -hmm. he um he also came like came up through the ranks of himself right so started by clay sculpting and the digital design process he became an expert in those fields and then became this uh, you know took risks and became a co-founder himself it's the same sort of, so also finding people that you mm -hmm. know are experts experts that you can listen to and believe in right mm -hmm. and so on the same like you're saying on the film set is in the costume design right so we had lorraine right who another strange story because she is here in America and lived on my street. Mm -hmm. Some things are just weirdly meant to be. Cause you, know? you for, cause I recall that, was that discovered on set or did you already know that jumping into the Oh, production? I knew that before. Right? Okay. I knew that beforehand. Right. And I knew that she, he like grew up on the same street on the same exact street. Back in, back down. in, back in England. Yeah. And then now you live on the same street it's, and still be. Well, we're, 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 we're in the same area. Right? Same area, yeah. Which is 
very strange. That's interesting. Same exact street when we were growing, right before we came to America, right? And didn't I didn't know her then. Right, this is the right, right, right. And we have a, a mutual close friend. And this is how we reconnected. So another one yeah. of those strange things. But yes, expertise in all areas, right? being able to see it, harness it, appreciate it, like you said. You have to show that appreciation mm -hmm. to those people to make that you really, like, it's not fake. You're like, I appreciate Lorraine because, my goodness, she did a phenomenal job with the costume design based on the vision, and her passion was in it too. Mm -hmm. You know, she's, she's been passionate about it the whole time. And she pulled in things, you know when it's going so fast that you can't even monitor things anymore? You have to trust yeah. that those people <laughs> yeah. are monitoring the, or doing the things that they say they're going to yeah, do. Yeah, you're talking about stuff. when you're on set specifically or just in general? Uh, before I, and after. Because I think about, on. I was thinking about like as a director on set, how that could... Because there's so much stuff going on that you forget about costumes and they come yeah. up to you and you're like, oh my gosh. Oh my god. I know. <laughs> and you have this relief, right? It's like, here you are. You look great. Let's oh get... my god. I know. It's like, <laughs> yes. It's like, and that's, when, and that's when that trust comes into play is that you can trust that person is going to deliver for you mm -hmm. and you don't worry. Oh, it's such a sense of, it's such a great feeling yeah, to have yeah. for sure. And Lorraine, not only that, but then getting all the costumes back together again to make sure nothing was lost, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Everything was in place, everything was hung up, everything was in good shape again for the next day. Or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the yeah, extra yeah. shoot. Yeah. Amazing. Th those people are amazing. Yeah. So, so th I don't have a proper segue, but let's <laughs> go. <laughs> let's go. We talked about briefly automotive. Um, yeah. What? Because, okay, again, a chance to talk about myself. Yeah, please. Please do. So, I didn't grow up thinking yeah. film was... That wasn't necessarily the, the all-knowingness of my younger self, knowing, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work towards film. That's my ultimate goal. Like, I didn't quite know that. So, <laughs> it's been a lot of work. Like, once I finally decided it, I was like, full steam ahead, let's do this. I, but uh, but until then, you know, you don't really know. So I'm curious on yeah. if you knew that writing and being in film and storytelling was always the dream, or what? How? Do, I love that you yeah. mentioned this because isn't it the way like everybody's path is either sometimes lucky, unique, but okay. So you're from England. From England. <laughs> yes, I'm from England. That's a good, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, so. Oh, it's complicated. And, um, and you, you, all right, I'll let you go from there. Take it. Okay, so my father um, and grandfather both worked in automotive. Okay. Right, um, my grandfather was design director, um, Bedford Trucks, and my father was um, excellent in design and a great artist as well. Um, in fact, we tried to feature one of his pieces in the film, but it didn't make the cut. I had to tell him that recently. <laughs> mm. But um, he's done um, a great children's book, and he's just a really good artist, and it was a good um, designer as well. Well, and I, <laughs> I was adamant at one point during the school route, going to, to college and so on, that I didn't want to be in the field, mm. right? And I loved performing arts in school. I played when you say When you say school, do you mean high school, college? Both, both. yeah, throughout, throughout okay. both, right? That I wanted to pursue, even though I got originally started with design, mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue creative writing, mm -hmm. Okay, which is what I essentially did in the end but the point is this is that i i was in love with performing arts in school um i was the artful dodger in oliver twist <laughs> okay right and i loved that role and in this was the the high it was like a six night high school production you know but mm -hmm. um when i got that role <clears throat> and i had to sing all of there's a character called fagan who couldn't sing um, the actor couldn't sing, so I sang mm. 
um, his songs and R and the Arthur Dodgers songs. Um, mm. And I could sing back then, and then I think my voice broke, and then your voice. I broke. can still kind of sing, but it's like it's definitely not what it used to be. My okay. voice broke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and my voice changed at that point. But anyway, sure, sure. Um, I felt I performing arts. I was on stage with this though. I was <laughs> performing and learning right, lines, right. and it it was a community you know a family like your friends were in it and this is where people came together that weren't necessarily that even the bullies at a the school they were like a person that had bullied me had found a talent in acting and had gone into the production right so you had all these people from different environments brought together and for for a good thing you know nobody was against each other everybody was pulling for this production and they were meeting after school and and rehearsing and everybody came as one mm -hmm. right no matter what yeah, you, you, you put your differences aside yeah, and yeah, we're, here really to, cool. we're here to make a thing right mm -hmm. and so i fell in with uh, fell in love then with performing arts i also um knew i was a massively hopeless romantic individual way early on so Poetry started to become sort of mm -hmm. my... An outlet? Yeah, outlet and also inlet. You know, with, that was my mm. thing with, with, with um, relationships as well, was to, mm. to see the beauty in people and then write... Uh, I mean, 90% of my poems are probably about girls or love that I've been with, dated with, or yeah. been inspired by. So I've always been inspired to write by something or someone, you know, and knew I had this love. So, and my dad got me, originally got me into the, des the design environment, but then I quickly realized that I, I needed to, I was a writer and I needed to pursue this. And my dad, to be fair, also wrote. So it's like, and my mom as well is creative. Mm. She's incredibly creative. She ran a creative shop, right? Okay. There's this, all, all, all been there. So, so in England, um, I already was that person. For sure, I was already wanting to act. I liked mm. productions, you know. Um, we also did, for my final exam in performing arts, there was a TV show called The Young Ones in England. Um, and we did an episode of that as our final exam with a good friend of mine, Andrew Ward, who went on to become a, 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 an editor at Ardman, uh, that mm. does all the claymation, like... Um, Chicken Run and like Wallace and Wallace Grant. and Gromit, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a he's a part. He was a part of he. So he was in my final exam with me, and we still talk now. Oh, nice. And everybody there, sort of, you know, they, you know, some of them went on to do great things. So I knew that was installed in me. But then, so my parents got divorced um, when I was ten, and my dad had come over to America, mm -hmm. and I was in college in England in sixth form college, and. Um, we hadn't talked in like seven years, and mm -hmm. this is how I came to to the states. Mm. Was my dad had contacted us and said, "Hey, why don't you come over to America?" And this was Michigan, and then we'll try and you know reestablish a relationship, and you know all of this. So um, my brother and I came over. My brother was two years younger. You know, I'd been in in college in England, and actually then did a year of high school in Michigan. You know, to, because people um, would be my same age. Mm -hmm. You know, we graduate high school at 16 in England and then you go on to, to the first stage of the college. Anyway, so... Um, so this was after college when your father reached out? No, in the middle of. Okay. So, so in, and this is why doing a year of high school at Clawson High School in Michigan is where I met all my close friends. Okay. Um, Again, because uh, to, to, to get to know people that were your own age, that was, you know, in, in America, you go to, to high school for, you're 17 and 18, and yeah. you stop at 16, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay, gotcha. That's the difference. So it's in order to make friends, basically. And so, um, so we did that, that's, so this, what, coming over to the States was for that reason, right? But then, um, my brother didn't stay long at all. <laughs> he didn't get along with... Um, as stepmother at the time, and um, and my father ended up also going back to Europe, but I felt I belonged in America. I didn't necessarily know that Michigan wasn't the right place, and it wasn't, and I'd realized that when I first came out to California. 
Uh, but I knew that Michigan was the right place. So, so my dad ended up going back to Europe. Mm. And I ended up going over there as well. I lived in Sweden for a couple of years mm. as well. And it's just like, there's so much. We're never going to get through all that. <laughs> sure. I ended up going to Sweden um, for, a, for a design job um, with Saab, mm-hmm. um, an automotive company, which were two of the best years of my automotive career Mm. anyway um the point is coming to the states i knew i belonged in the states and then when i came out to california the moment i got off the plane which was for again automotive it was for fisker automotive um the job there the moment i walked off the plane at john wayne airport in in uh, Mm -hmm. irvine um the hairs on the back of my neck all stood up and i knew I was home. It was the yeah, weirdest yeah. feeling that I hadn't had ever. Yeah. Right. So I guess to clarify, you you came back to reconnect with your father. Yeah. Yeah. Or not even back. You came for the first yeah, time. That's correct. To uh, Detroit. Yeah. Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah still, still in there. Looking at your hat. So then you were there for your high school. Yeah. And then made that, a decision to. And, and then he moved back, and you moved back. Se- separately? No, 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 no. Like I stayed on, and this was okay. this was where it gets into, as well, my mm. and, I, and I haven't told anybody about my. Guess we're gonna do it here, right? Suicide story. Whoa. Yeah. So I didn't. I wasn't planning. You know, I thought about whether we, and I'm like, if we go through a transitional path. But yes, um, I was in college here mm-hmm. in in well in Michigan. Um, and deciding where, where I wanted to be long term. And my, I had moved into my own place with a roommate. Oh, God, this is really coming out now, right? <laughs> so, um, okay, no, it's all good. It's all on the same because this is a part of who we are. Sure. Being 19 at this point. Plus, plus, I guess for me too, it kind of plays into why the story means so much mm-hmm. to you as well. It, it does. Yeah, it's true. It, it, that it's makes, true. It makes sense. So, um, Okay, so um, the short story is nothing to do with my dad. It was more to do with his wife. Um, just, she wasn't the best person. I, don't, I, I want to be careful here. She was um, not truthful, manipulated a little bit. Um, the short story is this. Graduating um, high school in Michigan, my close friend at the time, Rich, his parents had, as his graduation gift, had given him, um, they'd all pitched in money for him to go to England for a month. Mm -hmm. He was going to come, so we graduated, um, and then he was going to come back with me uh, to England, which was, again, there's another script in the making there from what was going on there. Mm. But um, came back with me, and all his family paid for it, right? So at the time, and this is absolutely true, there's no, this is, this is completely true to give you the insight into this. I had an inheritance at the time, which I was forced, fortunate enough to have, a very small one, it's not, it wasn't elaborate, um, but enabled me to, to, to get my flight back, and um, Rich had his money. And I was on the phone with a travel agent, this is 1992, mm-hmm. right? So <laughs> it dates me. So... Um, there weren't, you weren't able to go online and get airline tickets, right? Yeah. And so I was on the phone with the travel agent. The travel agent, who's of those? <laughs> and I was like talking about how I was going to get the airline tickets. And I was going to have to go down to the travel agent, pay for them, get mm-hmm. the tickets, mm-hmm. and they would come in the mail. The tickets would come in the mail. And so my stepmom hears me on the phone talking to the travel agent and says, Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't I just, because they needed a credit card mm-hmm. and I didn't have a credit card. Uh, you know, at 18 and coming out of school. Sure. And like, why don't I get the plane tickets? You give me the cash and then they'll come in the mail and everything will be good, right? That's great. So she gets on the phone, gives them their, her credit card information and I jokingly said, <laughs> jokingly with a laugh said, I don't, do I need, I don't need a receipt for this, do I? Right? So sometime like after the tickets come, we're all set to go, and um, 
and I'm at my uh, dad's house where they where they both live, and they come down and talk to me and say, my dad says, hey, we, we're going to need uh, the money for those plane tickets, right? And I'm like, must be some mistake because the bill has come from the, like, the visa company, or whatever. There must be some mistake because I gave cash that day to to said stepmom. So my dad goes, all right. Let's, let's. So he goes upstairs, and then they both come down, and she's screaming at me. She's like, "Why is she like calling me all you know lying?" Sure. To be fair to my dad, what's my dad supposed to do? You know, it's like he started rocking a hard place. You know, like. And so, long story short, is I had to pay for both flights again. Mm-hmm. Right. This this is what the, the relationship was like. Anyway, so that marriage fell apart, but I decided to stay. So. Stay in in Michigan, in okay. America. My dad went overseas, went and took a job in Sweden, which is one of the reasons I went later. But um, to, because we fell, we stopped talking to each other. Like we that we fell, and so um, and I'd just broken up with my girlfriend. And, like, there was a lot going on, and so yeah. So nineteen or twenty, um, I made an attempt on my own life, which I would never do. Like you know, so far beyond that, that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. But knowing what it means to, that everyone's got, I mean, some people don't, have never thought about it or don't even conceive the possibility of doing it. And I understand that. Their line must be, you know, so very low. But I, I there were lots of factors. First of all, I had seasonal depression and this was winter. And I didn't even know what it was. Mm-hmm. Right? That was one thing. And like moving, like coming out of Michigan, I never experienced that ever again coming to California. Mm-hmm. Like in the winter time, I didn't even know what was going on with me. Mm-hmm. But it's very low, very blue. There was that and other things. And then anyway. Yeah, because the seasonal, that's just because of the, because the, I've, never, I've never been to Michigan. So I'm assuming. It's Six months of, <laughs> they tell you it's like a, uh, like seasons are supposed to be every three months, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my <laughs> Michigan friends will joke about it because they love it there for the seasons. Um, the seasons. Right, the seasons. Because winter is six months, basically. It's, it's from half the year. Okay. Yeah, it's November and it spreads sometimes until April, May, right? So mm-hmm. it's a long time. Yeah. But it is, it's like the, something about, I, I love snow, but I want to go to it. I don't want to live in it all the time, right? And so it's like, yeah, the darkness, the snow, just the dreariness, it like mm-hmm. has a, a the seasonal depression. And I didn't know about it. I didn't mm-hmm. even know what it was. I didn't even know it existed until sure. moving to California where it didn't happen to me anymore, right? And that's a, that's a beautiful discovery to have this. Because even when I understood what had happened wasn't something I should have done, you know, and I was lucky mm-hmm. to, to get away with it in the end. There was still this doldrum cycle, right? And then again, in, in California, it doesn't. So there is something to be said about living in the right place too, mm-hmm. about mental health, right? Yeah, and, mental health is big. Right. And, and again, yeah, back to this yeah. whole thing and why yeah. it's important um, to again, talk about the foundation as well. So we should briefly talk about that. So the real girl in the story, Megan, uh, who's Claire in our story from Under the Bridge, her mother, Tina Meyer, after her daughter had committed suicide, right, mm-hmm. then starts this foundation a year later um, to help um, provide support and um, um, anti-bullying, you know, um, th- this whole foundation here. She starts in 2007 and Tina has been doing it ever since. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so that's, and we finally, and this kind of comes into play with the whole true story thing. What can you say? Inspired right, by right. real events. Yeah. I was so scared to call Tina, the mother, and on um, Megan's what would have been her 28th birthday, November the 6th. I just got anonymous flowers and I still don't know who the flowers came I got three sets of flowers. I still don't know who they came from. Right? Mm-hmm. It's really strange. And, but it just, I got this, this set of flowers and I'm like, I need to, it's time. I need to call um, Megan's mother and tell her about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so I called the foundation. And I know, again, we're all over the place. Yeah, it's all good. I called the foundation on that day. And I was scared that it wasn't going to be a 
necessarily a positive you know result i don't know the situation or how many you know people have contacted or mm-hmm. done this or how she would even feel was she in a good place with it yeah i don't yeah. know i called the foundation of course she was off on that day because it would have been her daughter's birthday i assume that's why she was off so i talked to one of the representatives at the foundation maddie maybe Katie's the one that's there now, but anyway, talked to her mm-hmm. and gave my story and what I was doing, hoping, and she's very positive in response and said, hey, it all sounds good. You know, why don't you send Tina an email? Here's her address. So I did the same. <laughs> <laughs> the email became pages, right? So yeah. I want to, you want to get everything in there and this whole story and, you know, how respectful you've been a- along the way, how integral you are about the story, how... Um, respectful you are just like I wanted all of this relayed and so I didn't Mm -hmm. want to hold anything back Mm -hmm. and then I sent it and then I waited I'm like please be positive please positive. yeah you're like double checking it you're going over it you're like right all right it's going yep right hands away right Mm -hmm. and then she got back to me and then we set up a zoom call and then since then I we bond I feel we bonded and how recent was that that was so November the sixth when I first this contacted her. November. It was right a few days afterwards, and then since then we've had cast calls. She's met the cast, mm. um, separate ones. Once one with uh, Rachel and Luke and Sarah and you know and um, Ryan. The majority of the cast, Piper wanted to kind of wait because to her, to Piper, she's playing her daughter essentially. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. So we had a separate one for that, but they all went very well. And Piper's an advocate of anti-bullying anyway, so she's one reason she got into this film. And so, um, yeah, and so since then we've had a lot of conversations. We text each other. She's, I tell her the intimate details of my life, including some current circumstances that are going on. And, um, and we've talked about helping each other in other ways as well. She's... She's writing her story, which is fant- mm. fantastic, and and collaborating in that way uh, to help her write the best possible piece uh, creatively as mm-hmm. well. That's um, and that's more discussion. of like a it's more like a memoir. It's more novel, chapter novel. Okay, you know, an autobiographical novel, uh, um, which she could definitely use a a creative touch on. Mm-hmm. But again, the story, it goes beyond. Yeah, yeah, it's just crafting and yeah. sculpting. and Stylizing, yeah, yeah stylizing. And um, it goes beyond, what we have is a small... Sliver. Yeah, of the time. There's also what happened immediately after. The real, the real person was a neighbor that was still inviting them to birthday parties. And like still, before the FBI found out where the IP address had come from for this fake profile. Mm. There's mm. all of this story and then the aftermath and then Tina's own fight with, yeah. you know, keeping That's, it together. and the whole other yeah. story. Yeah. And then the foundation. And then before that, you know, what led up to that, you know, there's like, there's a, a whole massive, amazing story in there for sure that mm. definitely needs to be told in its entirety. And then the trials. Okay, what about the... Um, Mm. was this wrong was it wrong for somebody to get in and create a fake profile and then bully somebody turns out nope because there weren't any regulations or laws in place for that so that there, there were no yeah it was too early yeah because i mean that's kind of one of the classic themes of the internet right where it's stuff is happening at a rate that the law can't keep up with yeah. and this is one of those situations yeah where... so i think there were four or something there were four um Indictments, what do you call them, or charges, or like, and mm-hmm. then they just one of them, one by one, they just got knocked out because there was nothing in place. And I think right now it's like it's the job of the social media company to to mm. you know to make statements against where well, you can't create fake profiles and well, there's still not really any laws. So let's let's start there. I think because yeah. that's a good point in time in Michigan. Um, coming back from living in Sweden, working in automotive, but still sold the script and how the, the short story yeah, on that is. Yeah, because you were mentioning 
but there was this itch and there was this burn inside of you that creative yeah. Yeah. creative writing was something yeah. you were like that's what you that was the want versus what versus I don't know what caused you to continue the automotive I'm sure My, sadly being 22 um, oh, money I don't think that's sad it's I know it is it is because what I would say now is to anybody mm. is to follow your passion because it's the even if you don't make as much as you could have you still won't like the the, the cliche statement of you won't feel like you you work a day in your life if you're doing what you really love to do mm -hmm. is absolutely true yeah and like now I can't I work so hard work so hard but it never feels like it's like when you're creating mm -hmm. things when you're developing stories like it never feels i could work 24 7 sometimes and sometimes do work through the night and it's the next day and it doesn't feel like a job it doesn't feel like a job and and mm -hmm. and i feel like i'm doing something productive and good and that yeah. draws from what i have inside you know? yeah because i like because I think about, because I went to college, I got my bachelor's in an engineering field. Oh, right. okay. You as, did as well. Um, and I did it kind of, I don't, because that's why I kind of thought maybe you are on the same track, but yours is different, where I didn't know that that my ultimate creative oh, you didn't. dream, like I didn't know yet. Like I kind of refound it through the college experience. Right, right. But I went in, I'm like, this is the smart route to take because money is important and right. art classically we hear we hear what pursuing the artistic side right, seems right. the unknowns and all that stuff. But yeah, regardless. But so so that's why so in automotive I made that, that mm -hmm. choice. I got this position uh, to become a digital designer, basically, um, out of out of school. And while I was still um, going, and so I got into that, and it was paying like it was like twelve bucks an hour, like it was twelve dollars an hour, mm -hmm. you know, and like that. Let so I ended up getting into getting the same field as my grandfather, and my father, but still writing all the time, writing for relationships, um, love, um, just all the time, and and. Over time, then I still I started getting into um, wanting to write a screenplay, mm -hmm. and I had this this cool story, which I guess we don't. You just need to know that it, that it came together well, and along the then you educate yourself about technical writing as well. Yeah, for how did you how did you do that? Um, so th you get some education through school on how to write correctly, grammar and. and and set up and so on is the basic but then to get to true i because there's a difference between english writing right and screenplay writing right. yeah i as as i was writing the script where i needed to investigate on how to do that portion correctly i referenced existing film scripts yeah in order to like what does it mean when you want to introduce a character correctly or like how do you and then I just made sure that I did yeah so you're like oh I want to include a montage let me research yeah, right. some scripts of the montage exactly. in there. Okay. self education mm -hmm. which I think all creative people do whether it's learning to use a software like Photoshop or or um, um, any kind of creative discipline in general you do self research anyway you mm -hmm. know because you're interested in it and you want to know more I mean, now we have YouTube that can give you an understanding on how to light properly. Like, I'm not saying that that's the way you should solely go. I'm not. But there are channels now that you can yeah. educate yourself to mm -hmm. a certain degree. Um, so, again, I was writing along the way. And I, I'd written a couple of, a couple of scripts that I liked. They were... Sit, I, I had my house and um, I bought my house. I wanted to... One, one of these things that we talk about achieving i wanted to have a house that i owned by 30 mm -hmm. and i had a house in lake orion michigan at the age of 30 and they're just these goals and so one of the in the three bedroom house one of the um it was a, uh, a dedicated room to as an office and up in there i had the poor man's copyright which is a um self-sent registered mail sealed envelope oh, yes. of, of my script yes. and next to it was um, 
this particular script was the paper bound copy, right? And I was dating a girl that worked for an agency in California. This mm. is how it all, this is the story now. <laughs> and her father was British. Um, she was a she was going to she was studying um, entertainment law, but working as a PR girl at an agency to where when clients came in, um, she would, you know show them the town, you know, take them around Hollywood and, mm-hmm. and L.A. And um, that was her job while she was going to, to entertainment law school. And she also had a British father. We enjoyed talking about films. Yeah. And watching films. And I, I can't say enough about when you're looking for somebody with a foundation, um, to this, the common ground in something like this is really, it, it's a big deal, right? hmm and so we loved this. So we would talk so much about like scripts and what made a bad film and a good film. Anyway, so eventually, reluctantly almost, I showed her my script, right? Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh my God, the agency would love this. It's like, like, this is so good. And it's like, no, I'm not ready. It's not good enough yet. It's not properly finished. I haven't like, I need to revise this, 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 and this. This scene's not good. That's like, that dialogue is like, it doesn't, it's not real. Because... When you're doing dialogue, I believe that you actually have to walk around your place and speak the language. Like, actually, okay. Talk, yeah. okay. If there was a camera on the wall when I'm writing, <laughs> it would be weird because I'm going down there. You, oh, no, no, no. you, you want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. you want to hear it. It has to be. You want to feel it. Right. And mm-hmm. that's the one of the... Is a, this is a trade secret now, right? I think that the biggest problem with screenwriting is that people don't do that. Mm. Really understand that their dialogue is real or they can't yeah. write for different characters it's a lot of time that the dialogue is by one person and they don't break and it's yeah it's, yeah it's, i mean it's, we've, we've all watched stuff where you can if you're looking at it from the filmmaker's perspective or even sometimes something's off you don't know why it's off sometimes it comes down to like this the dialogue sounds like writing versus people talking yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know the difference mm-hmm. So Gemma is sitting there and she's like, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. And this was in Michigan. She'd come to see me in Michigan. So I'm like, I'm, I'm not ready. And you know the Stephen King story, right? It's her wife. Uh, Stephen mm-hmm. King's wife with the book Carrie basically pulled it out of the trash and sent it in, right? That's oh, a true story. I, okay. It, it's something, I'm not comparing myself to Stephen King. <laughs> really. but, um, sure. So she snuck into my office before she was heading back, getting rid of bags packed, you know, and she stole the script. She stole the loose copy, right? Mm-hmm. Not the registered, you know, poor man's copyright one. And um, I didn't know, because it was the office. It was like, you know, like, that's not where you spend all your time. And I wasn't going to go look for this. It's like, I thought it was done. And she went, left, went back to LA. And then about 10, week to 10 days, no, 10 days, 10 to two weeks, um, she calls me up and she's like, hey. <laughs> Like, hi, what's going on? Are you right? She's like, don't be mad at me. Like, why would I be mad at you? And she's like, I kind of took your, I kind of took your script. I can't, I'm like, how do you kind of, so there was like, I'm like, and I was, I felt the blood go into, I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, what does that mean? Right? And then she's like, and I turned it in and, and everyone thinks that you got a shot here, like at the agency. And, um, and at first, I let the few like get. I'm like, how could you? How could you take my script and provide me with this amazing opportunity? How could you do? It was all chance, right? And that is a, a yeah. business. Yeah. This business is all chance sometimes. So she took it. She turned it in. Bless her. She did the right, right thing in retrospect. I got over my frustrate. My how could you? By the yeah. Way. Once you realized that it was a great opportunity. Right. And um, they got me, in, they got me conversations. This is a true story with um, Universal, which I didn't like, so I turned it down. And the agency was like, "What? People would give their right arm for this? Like, what's wrong with you? This is like you'll never get this." Opportunity. I'm like, "Cause I want to write more. Mm-hmm. Like, I wanted to structure something where I could write additional pieces, which mm. is what I got in the end, mm. which is where the TV series comes from and so on." Mm. And um, 
And so I like I shut that down, and then we had a. Um, so you wanted to negotiate for I'm going to sell my script, uh, but I right. want. A, I'll take less money if you give me first like a, right of refusal for me. Yeah, a promise. Okay. Yes, exactly yeah. right. So mm-hmm. three. I wanted. I want you to take a look at two more pieces, and 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 I'll take less money for the first one, but then we'll structure an increase for the second one, and if you like that one, an increase for the third one, which is where we're at. And so they were not happy because for them, it was the commission on, or the um, right. percentage on whatever. On the initial sale. Right. Mm-hmm. And so we had this big discussion, and but it all went okay because then we got a meeting with Castle Rock, and then essentially this is where WB comes, Warner Brothers comes into play. It's like, that's, the script ended up selling for a reasonable amount, but not enough that you could retire on. So how did you build up that, uh, I'll, I'll call it courage, to, yeah. to set those guidelines for yourself? How did you know that's what you wanted when, when you weren't even, when you didn't even submit it yourself? Like yeah. you created these, <laughs> sure. I need this. Like right. how, how did that, how did, you do, how did you develop that and stick to it? That they, it feels I know, right? Difficult. It's, um, I think it's like anything. You have a vision and you stick to it. I think it, it, it's kind of, it goes hand in hand with with the way that we create um, stories and films. Is I didn't want to compromise that. I, I it didn't. It wasn't essentially mm-hmm. the money wasn't the driving force. It was the story. It was mm-hmm. my story too. My development. Yeah. But it, as we know, it came to a crashing stop because I met then. After Gemma, like that all transpired. I went out to LA. We did, even did some unshelving. So you, got, so you got the sale. Yeah, I got the sale. You got your you got your ask on the next looks. I can tell you what the sale was as well. If you, if sure. you want to, because sure. it was relevance. It was two two hundred and fifty. Mm-hmm. But after taxes and fees, like it was, and I could have got over half oh. a million for it. After taxes and fees. But I wanted the other deal, right? Sure, which is, sure. Which was good in the end because it kept me relevant, connected as well. Um, so that so so it was less than half, less than half. Okay. Um, that which you was ended good. up that ended up in your bank at the end. Exactly. Kind of. Okay. So um, so then um, went through some some other um, brief relationships, but then met Kate. My, my wife, and um, she was in med school. She was just starting med school. Mm-hmm. And so then you're faced with a decision at that point. Yeah, I couldn't either. I was going to be in a relationship that I knew I was going to have to keep working solidly. As we got into this, I realized I was making this decision out of love for myself. And this is the stuff. The hard true story of it all is secretly and I I made this choice uh, like even without fully disclosing what opportunities I had maybe mm-hmm. I made this decision to invest in this relationship rather than the dream mm-hmm. which I would just maybe say now is, uh, it's a tough decision right because like Finding the right partnership and relationship is is also a gift, yeah. Right, yeah. if it, if it's if it's long term true, if it doesn't work out, but you can't you can't know you, you can't know you can't know. I like so, guess that's a difficulty, right? There you go. So I made the I made the decision um, to to put that on the shelf, right? Mm-hmm. This momentum. And to where most people would, you know, and maybe like fate, timing, who knows? Maybe it's all things are meant to be. I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't. Mm-hmm. I think that you make your own luck sometimes. And but that in two thousand and six, when we met, it put that on pause, and I stuck with the automotive career as a design manager at so you, the time. So you had options there to go back to if you needed to. Kind of. I was thing. still doing it. This was happening simultaneously. The oh. script, the script sale. I was still in my job. Okay, because I guess my thought was when you came to Michigan, like I wasn't quite sure if that was still. No, yeah, okay. Was, so 
yeah, and it's a good point. I was still in Michigan at the time mm-hmm. of the script sale. I was coming, to, and, but I discovered California, and I loved California, mm-hmm. or Southern California. Um, it wasn't until 2009, the end of 2009, that I moved to California, physically moved to California, mm-hmm. because of the job I was in and Kate's residency mm-hmm. at UCI. Okay. And that was where I had to, at that point, I had to fully, I knew that dream was of, of the film industry and the script at that point in time was done, because Kate was going into, into residency, which was such a low, and they don't deserve to be paid so low. Yeah, that stuff's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's like 40, 40 to 50, around 50,000 a year, but for all five years, right? Mm-hmm. And you're learning more and more and more and doing more and more and working crazy shifts. But the point is, is that I took my dream, I didn't know a way, maybe completely, I didn't want to, but I took that dream and, and shelved it in order to support the relationship Faster have a family and get married in residency, mm-hmm. and then fellowship. So it was like, right. Med, so med school, two thousand six. One, two, three, four years of med school. One, two, three, four, five years of residency. One year of fellowship. So ten years. Ten years of supporting until the first year of the career, which is still, and then going into the career. So mm-hmm. this is. So, but we had an agreement that then at a certain point into the career, I would then be able to return to, to, the dream, to your to your love, your craft, to my love. Which, which, fortunately for me, that 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 everybody hung on to me. They literally said that they were going to let they couldn't carry me in the books anymore. They had to make a decision mm-hmm. either to commit to this industry, and this is where we are today, um, or. Let me go. And everybody that, that knows how hard it is to get an agent, manager, or, or otherwise knows that, that it's not just something you take for granted, right? So on the very last day of the deadline, which was May 31st, 2019, I quit my vice president job, which again, vice president in design, the youngest VP at the company as well. I'm a peaking career, like to give... That's like mm-hmm. to to cut it and know that you like that was it done, and to commit then to working on new projects, but with the premise that you get paid at the end or contracts develop as you go. Mm. That's what it is, mm-hmm. right? And then um, other stuff has happened. <laughs> sure, sure. Which didn't quite align, but the point is that. I, you support the relationship, and then you find it. I, and and do I regret it now? Not pursuing it right? No, I think timing is everything. And well, at the same, at the, okay. Because <laughs> my, my my thought too, when you ask when you ask yourself the question about regret, I'm thinking that's not a that's not a really a productive question because regret doesn't help anything really. Nice. So I mean, yeah, you're in the position that you're in, and you're yeah. and you're you're moving, and you're making. And it might have gone so, differently. So my my question too is, the deal, like you said, they couldn't keep you on the books, or whatever. They, to, they were going to cut me. They were going to cut you. Yeah, but they didn't because I I you jumped back on the last, I, the last moment. No, what I did was I we had an agreement that mm-hmm. I would either that I would commit to doing film mm-hmm. by... Or by May 31st of 2019 mm-hmm. or I would not. And okay. if I had not quit my job and committed then, shown commitment, then it was over. I was done. Okay. I was done as far as representation. But, but that opportunity was only given to you because you stood up for yourself on that first sale. Yeah. That's very cool. That, that's, that's crazy. I, I hadn't awesome. reflected on that until you just went there. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. no. That's, the, so, that's a good point. <laughs> You're right. That's a good point. That's a good point. So yeah, because it's setting it up. Longevity. Yeah. So, so because, <laughs> right. okay. Because without that, mm. it's a different story. Like if you, if you had just sold it for the bigger, for the bigger paycheck at that time, yeah, right. the opportunity wouldn't be laying, waiting for you. By March 2019 yeah. or whatever. That's very... Plus, yeah, they, 
they also, because we, they had unshelved it and that they were screen testing and we'd met some cool actors through it all, mm-hmm. one of who became an investor in this film, which, which we can't talk about, but I'll tell sure, you off, sure. off camera. Um, because of all that, there's also belief in that I could make them more money, right? Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's sure. true. Yeah. And it came, it was instantaneous. When, I, when I, un, I unveiled the concept that I'd been working on with Criminal Spirit, which is the latest project, that started as a film, and then we were in, we were in what was supposed to be, an, an, I think it was a 19-minute meeting that turned into four hours, where then mm. the studio mm-hmm. canceled they're following me to meetings because we were like it was in the conference room was glass wall like the glass walls we can draw on and while I was yeah, doing the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. parallel path subplots and timeline and and then it really did turn into and they left a couple they got a council next meeting but they knew like it was the what we what we know about ourselves was there and I'm like confident I'm just a confident person in my the vision and ability to create a narrative in the story is that this hadn't been done before, number one, which is harder and harder to come by. Mm-hmm. Um, incredibly deep, also has mega twists from you know potential, right? Sure. And so in this meeting after four hours of drawing it up, and looking at them, and they were paid so much attention, just like you have today. And I give you credit for this because I know how I talk, and I'm so passionate about stuff. I'm like, ah, it's all good. That's that's it, right? The storytellers. Um, I looked at them, and they were so overwhelmed, and like they were like, they were really drawn into this. And I said, I know it's a lot to take in, right? It mm-hmm. could almost be a TV series, and I was describing it as a mm-hmm. film. And so the studio that also has a media department partnership um, said you know they paused right and this is the, this is I guess the conclusion story now of like where we're at today mm-hmm. and I looked at the, the agency and I'm like what's going on I'm standing up there I'm doing it this looks so cool you know all these colors you know all these lines and all these milestones of the story yeah She's like, I, it's like you can imagine doing that, right? You know, that if you know your story so well, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like just crazy. It's like, like it looked like it looked like um, the the English uh, <laughs> tube system. So you're you're in a meeting, mm. yeah, pitching a feature script, mm-hmm. and that had was already good. You really? say something that you did not plan, no, just and you were like, "This is so deep; it could be a series." Right. And then you go on with your, th- with your thing. You realize everybody is distracted. All of a sudden, you don't know what's going on. Because uh, I didn't know the line was relevant. They ask to leave the room for a second. Yep. Pick us up from there. So, okay, good. So I was once. So I leaned down on a table, and I was like, "Did I do anything wrong?" You know, because you want. I want. If I did something wrong, yeah, criticism. You, you could have offended or something. Right, no. I did, right, I didn't know. And they're like, no, this is like totally fine. And the line had been gone. It was like, it was like minutes before, it was like five minutes before. We'd moved on mm-hmm. since I said it could yeah. almost be a TV show. And I literally just meant that it was so intense and there were all of these twists and turns and references. And so, so they came back in and they were so just really cool. And they said, you know, they'd been on the phone directly with the media side of um, the studio. And they wanted now to, as hard as it was for them from the film side, to turn this over because for sure it was probably more lucrative for one to turn mm-hmm. it over. And to, yeah, it like they, they needed to they discussed as whether it could be sequels of a film. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And, and there was that potential too. So they wanted the opportunity to go away and discuss that mm-hmm. with what I talked about for the second Yeah, se- yeah. Whether it's film. a feature with sequels or right. if it's a series. Okay. Because, and I don't want to give, I'll tell you off of, 
Sure, you know? sure. But what happens in the second film or the second series flips what happens in the first, right? It's mm -hmm. it just it it takes the curve and goes on the other side of a line, right? Mm -hmm. Dramatic. It's, it's it's crazy cool. It's crazy cool, and. Um, so they were really respectful and, and they said, what we're going to do is we're going to simultaneously, simultaneously, simultaneously. Simultaneous is... is it, which one is right? I say simul. Simultaneous is... Uh, Simultane this is where you like come, in, like come into America, which has a sequel. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be simul. It's simul. Oh God, it's what garage and garage and like all of these words, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, happening at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> So they said, um, what we'll do is we'll, ass we'll assess at the same time um, if these can be sequel films where you, because they got, they got blown away by what was going to happen next at the end of the first film. Mm -hmm. We'll look at it independently while we bring on, um, oh, I almost said the company, uh, our media side of this big studio uh, to evaluate the TV series option. I'm like, okay, I guess that's a good thing. It's just like, oh, but TV. So what we do is, so the short story is this. Mm -hmm. It has now become TV, which if I'm honest is better for me. I get to, in a contract, direct episodes, which, oh, is like you understand this, to be able to direct something. Mm -hmm. And probably in a film, I'm not going to get to direct anything, right? But the contract now sets up for, for the TV series to direct episodes. And you get all of these. And it, this isn't, again, it's not about money, but it involves money. What it is is about um, potential and opportunity, right, to do things that you want to do. Right? Yeah, and like yeah. grab all these aspects of filmmaking, which is it started with writing. And God, right, producers hate being pitched by writers. I've heard, like, you know, it's mm. very difficult. Starts with writing, but now, because they've seen the first cut of this, because they're investors in right, this, right. there's so many links now, and they're like, oh, like, natural director, that was nice to hear. Like, you've got the... So now that has come into play, like, okay, we'll write you in three episodes of directing mm -hmm. into the contract. And so all of these things, so I can write, direct, created by, is a big deal mm -hmm. for contractual... And then, and then, okay, keep continuing. No, I'll get to the end. But what's become very difficult is it's so hard to take a film concept, cut it into 10 pieces, mm -hmm. make sure every piece is of equivalent strength mm -hmm. to make sure that then they reference each other somehow, some way throughout, that they continue the narrative, that you um, unveil twists in the right spot, that you reference back it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And if you're a confident writer and producer, you don't want the writing help. Mm -hmm. right? uh, mm -hmm. we, we, you we, and I talked about this. We talked actually. about this. You at collaborated. The, at our, I couldn't uh, do it. At our little rap. Our little rap yeah, party. Yeah, the rap party. For, for, yeah, because I talked about, for me, it's yeah. very helpful to have a co-writer. Right. Because I enjoy having the bounce board and talking through stuff. And really, it's like, here's the general thing I'm thinking. What do we do with this? Like, that kind of stuff is very helpful for me. Yeah. But you mentioned that that's not how you work. You work differently. Right. Um, I think I can collaborate with... Like working with Matthew, for example. Sure, sure. I mean, the ability to collaborate is there, but the preferential approach is more, I'm a solo writer, I know the twists, and I'll figure it out myself. Right. Yeah. It's the writing I don't... And that's the point. Mm -hmm. On writing, I don't think I can collaborate because it... it You're too deep in, yeah. Yeah, it gives yeah. me... Because I have so much vision on what I'm developing, I don't think I can compromise. Right, and I think because I just I know what I want there. I think, mm -hmm. but on collaboration, when it involves other disciplines, right? As like, a as a director, that's yeah, a different, different story. Completely, I I want I loved having Matt there. Right, I loved Connie. And again, I can't give enough shout. Like, yeah, I like like having CJ there is essential, and I want her feedback mm -hmm. on everything. I trust her with anything. Sure. 
Uh, Matthew the same. He's an incredible DP. I would. He can bring anything to the table, and I will absolutely listen. All of these other costume design, anything. I was waiting for him to mention me. But for sure, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. for sure, essential part of it. Script supervision, without a doubt. <laughs> if you come in, even when I look at like like production, creative content, right? As a producer, as a producer, not as a writer. If I look at your production, like your recent video, sure. <laughs> which again I love, God, because like you look at so much stuff on on online and on social media, and you're just like, okay, swipe. I looked at this and I actually wanted to go to you. There was a hook, and I know we're off again. There was a <laughs> hook because you had a short one, right? It was a short thirty second, short thirty second, and it was like. And then I'm like, oh my God, Listen, I have to see the whole thing. And then when you went into name pronunciation and that's so all we have time for, I'm like, oh God, I was actually crying. I'm like, this is so funny. So when we talk about production and collaboration, yes, I could absolutely do it. As a writer, sure. it, it gives me anxiety yeah, to, to start hearing I, changes. I've, I've heard that before, like uh, on, I listened to a podcast called Script Notes. I'm yeah. not sure if you're familiar. Yeah, I know, I know. They had, um, man, I don't even know the name, the guy that wrote uh, Queen's Gambit. Oh, right, right, right. Um, have you watched the whole thing yet? I watched the series. Yeah, same they had him on Script Notes to talk about how great it is and stuff. And he had the same thing. It's it's a mini limited series. It's a limited mini series. Yeah, it was good. And he's been trying to pitch it as a feature for a long time, and it got picked up as a series. Oh, is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. He mentioned way back in the day, Heath Ledger was going to direct the feature version of it with Alan Page, or well, uh, at the at the time starring. So that was like a whole thing that they oh, were no. developing. No, Alan Page. Nice. So he was saying at the time, or yeah writing the limited series he's yeah. like that's just me like i'm just i know the story yeah yeah yeah, and yeah that's just that's just people have different and that's that's true and they offered up they offered up the help mm -hmm. as it like to be fair as an honest um offering like you know like writing tv is absolutely different and it wasn't like it wasn't a condition, right? So they said, if you want it, this yeah, yeah, will yeah. help you to structure. It's yeah. called structuring, right? Yeah. So now you take you take a concept and you have to break it down, structure it. Um, what they didn't tell me was is that when the structuring process, that they give you more time. So mm. this I had to fish mm. out myself. I'm like, oh my god, it's so much. Look at like I can't do this. I need more time. It's like, okay, all you need to do is ask. I'm like, why didn't you just tell me? It's like, are trying to break this down. So I got like, you get months for structuring, mm -hmm. right? And like, I, but I had to ask it. So these things you learn, that's something I learned along the way. Yeah. Is that you get the opportunity to take a concept and break it down into pieces and then work out like, because that's, like a, yeah, yeah. Cause that's a separate process from, from the writing. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not even writing. It's just, the outline yeah, yeah. and the yeah yeah and how are you going to you know tie everything in and mm -hmm. it's like you know have you ever done in, have you ever done episodes i i'm in the the my first process of experimenting with episodes yeah. oh then yeah. maybe we what, should we've got, touch we've got i've got a, got a pilot Oh, with, with, with my co-writer that we've we busted out, but and this is the one that works only with this comedy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and we've we've Korean person. Yeah, she's half half Korean. Yeah, just like yeah, uh, Korean American. Just, things get nugged in. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're working through right now is like, all right, let's look through, let's let's d develop our story bible and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes, uh, let's yes. Look at what the season looks like. All those kinds of things are discussions <laughs> yeah. we're currently in right now. So, like the bible is another word you learn along this yeah, way. Right? I didn't yeah, know yeah. that there was a, a episode or chat or a episode bible mm -hmm. or what have you. But yeah. But yeah, that sounds fair. So currently, all right. So that's where you are currently. Professionally. Professionally. And we'll... It's a lot of money. So... <laughs> <laughs> it is a lot of money. I wasn't going to ask about the money, but that's great. I could, like, I don't... Is it something that we share? Or I don't mind sharing that there is a lucrative side of this. Like when something... 
But again, I well, think... that's I mean, th- I think that's what people are pursuing when they're when they are pursuing the craft of the like. You yeah. know, you want the you want the lottery hits and that yeah. we're we're all churning. That's right. The slots. The, I think that it, it comes from the passion, though. I've heard. Um, I mean, you can you can disclose it, but I will preface. Uh, on script notes, the guy wrote Chernobyl, HBO. Oh, so um, good. Yeah, so he was talking. So good. So he was talking about when he was structuring his season. Yeah. He gets upset with other shows that stretch out over more episodes than they need. Um, oh right. Because there's that right. issue too, where you're like, you, right. and he's like, you know, guys, I could I could make the seven episodes versus Ozark. What what is that um, on Netflix? With Ozark that? is a show. Yeah, that did that. Okay. The, it's on the, they got it, it turned me off. But go, go on, go on. So, go on. Uh, Craig Mazin is the writer. And what he was saying, he's like, yo, HBO, I think this would play better if I, if I cram these two episodes into one episode. It'll play much better. We can do seven episodes versus eight. And over, I agree with this. And overall, this is a better show. And then they said, said that. They, yeah, they said yes. And then he later he found out, I was like, wait, I get paid per episode. <laughs> so I took a pay cut. He, he took a pay cut without really but knowing it. But it's true. It. Yeah. So, but some That's people true. will stretch it out to the eight episodes because okay. the money. Um, so there's that weird balance of... Mine... Okay, this is interesting. Mine was set at 10. Just because that's the standard of, of the episode run... Mm-hmm. I was it that like I got it got suggested to me and that's what we ran with is this a ten episode mm-hmm. thing. Um, I think also because there was a pitch to Apple as well, like without disclosing who it's with right now, because it is a semi done deal. Um, that ten episodes just was what everybody. It's kind of like a standard to, a little bit. Yeah, a standard. Um, and especially for... I, I well, probably just felt... Well, because Chernobyl was... It's designed how as much a, was... It, what was that? Do you remember? How much? How many episodes? I, I've never seen it. It's good. I, I feel like... It's, it's really I feel good. like it's seven, but maybe that's just... Good on you. Misremembering. Um, <laughs> but yeah... But that was, again, a limited series. So he had one story to tell over one season you know so it's not an ongoing thing like this maybe 10 episodes is yeah, yeah. the preferred if it's an ongoing thing i don't i don't know yeah but. no it's interesting but anyway okay so 10 so 10 is the mark and now i i've managed to again it's like going back to what we're talking about is like self-education mm-hmm. right is like getting in there structs can you structure it yourself can you break it down and this is where you just take on new approaches or getting the whiteboard out, like getting the whiteboard out and starting to, to mm-hmm. break things down and like, yeah, um, but it's going, it's going okay. And I don't need the collaborative writers. <laughs> <They offer laughs> you're doing, you're doing just fine. Right. That's great. But yeah, okay. so you are, man. That's a, that's a lot. All right. That's, that's a ton. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the time. What? I would I would feel bad if we didn't talk about the other topic that I mentioned. We'll just cram it in here at the very end to r- yeah. run the episode out here because it feels like I'm. It's probably more like I'll probably try to talk to you about having a catch up episode later to fill I out know, to I fill love out more. To you. You're so cool. Um, so talking, let's jump back to from under the bridge. Okay, and, good. And good. Bu- full circle. And bullying. So. Yes. So, oh, yes. so through the process of making this film and developing the story, the topic of bullying and cyberbullying and what it's doing to society and yeah. what it looks like these days and like all that kind of stuff, I'm very curious about. Um, yeah, thanks, Eddie. Um, okay. Thank you, first of all, but for returning to this point. It's, mm-hmm. it's really significant. When I began this, the story itself um, that Megan went through um, was in a time when um, social media, MySpace primarily was the main uh, social media environment. And I was actually drawn to it, really drawn to 
this new experience of uh, mm -hmm. putting yourself out there and sharing things with people because as creators and, and, and of, of content, you can get your stories out there and it's about storytelling and narratives. I think social media has a positive in that we're always telling stories and some of them are actually interesting. A lot of them are not, mm -hmm. right? If we're, people will put anything out there now and we all feel the same way. It's like, do, do I want to see your spaghetti bolognese, you know, with a filter? Probably not. But when people talk about, um, I have a friend, Heather or, and Kelly, they're two people who are going through cancer experiences, mm -hmm. right? And they're publishing their story online on Facebook. Um, one of them's going through chemo, Kelly, right now, and Heather has gone through um, uh, breast cancer. And they those things are like they're educational and inspirational and and interesting right when it's when they're telling a story mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily because that's what they just want to inform people but they turn it into a story right mm -hmm. so there's a place for social media in in being interesting and entertaining and so on back then this is what i saw it as an opportunity to 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 continue to tell stories to lots of people, to your friends, maybe they'll pay attention, maybe they'll, you can share stuff, mm -hmm. right? At the same time, what we didn't recognize was it was also an opportunity to be anonymous and bully or find another way to bully people globally or to make bullying easier, right? So now, People can hide, like whereas interpersonal bullying, if you and I are in a playground as kids, we're at least face to face and you have to stand behind what you're doing. Like if I'm in your face and I'm calling you whatever and being mean to you and bullying you, I'm still, I'm the person right here and I'm doing it as a person in your face. Mm -hmm. And there's still something to that, right or wrong, a, a, a sort of, you put yourself out there and it's like, with the internet. Yeah, there's some in the moment consequences you have to live with. Yes, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You, you, in the moment you have to like, and you were witnessed and you were there and you're, yeah, you're what, not hidden. Yeah, whether it's something that said back to you to your face or you're physically right. hit or well, whether whatever. Whether you're being scrutinized by teachers or what, you are representing yourself mm -hmm. and you are a bully mm -hmm. and you are then labeled and you're the person, you have a face to that bullying. With the internet, with cyberbullying, you can get behind a screen and you can be anonymous and you can ruin somebody's life as is in this story and literally cause, you can manipulate them as well. Um, very, very stealth, in a stealth way. You can manipulate them, you can bully them, you can hide, be, you know, yeah. you can be more of a coward bully right exactly. and get in somebody's life and cause them desperation and insecurity and at the end suicide because of what you can say that you type and you don't have a face and this is a, this is a perfect evidence of that is that you can even be somebody else that you're not mm -hmm. and go in and cause somebody to have a bad life right that to me is horrible right so that's the first chunk it's like the social media part of where this all began and where Megan's story began and where the script began was that. Mm -hmm. The bullying part was, yeah, because I'd been bullied in school. I got in a fight every year of high school with the same person to where the final year just became tradition, right? Because I was like, believe it or not, I know like I'm bigger now, but I was like six foot two and 135 pounds. Dang. Yeah, like like my friends used to call me a corpse, right? So I like, but so nice friends. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Because like this was, was the way of the world. But so I had my, I had my fights, you know. Um, I also had my defender, like so so. I had a good group of friends too. Mm -hmm. So I got in. There was one situation where I was bullied in class. A guy used to. I used to gel my hair. I used to do it like like it was like vanilla ice, right? It was like. Sure. It was like I had like, and I spent half an hour every day in my head. And there was one guy that came in. <laughs> it's just it's funny now, but it was his goal every morning just to come up to me, 
and he had mousse. Like back in the days, like with gel spray and mousse, if you freaking did all this, it would end up like standing out, like like completely messed up, and it would like there'd be white stuff everywhere because mm-hmm. it. And he, that was his goal every day was just to do that to me. So I used to start coming into class, even though like I had a good school relationship, but I started like not wanting to get in early. I wanted to walk in right on the bell because mm-hmm. I didn't want to go through this. Yeah. Right. And um, one day I came in and the guy came up and did it again and then my friend Andrew Knight um, um, is a, a, a black guy in my class was very quiet but very strong powerful guy the fastest sprinter in our school was a great athlete never really would expect him to do anything it just came like right up and he grabbed Aaron oh, the guy <laughs> grabbed him put him up against the wall didn't say much. I don't remember what he said, and this was in high school. Didn't say much. Lifted him against the wall. Everybody was watching. And then it never happened again. So there was that bullying, physical bullying now, which I experienced. I never did myself because I had good guidance. Mm-hmm. right? And this is the other part of it. My parents, my mother, who single-handedly raised my brother and I, taught us diversity by act like leading by example. She didn't tell us, don't be mean to, to a different race or don't be mean to a person. She just was good to everybody, right? So she led by example. Mm-hmm. We became very diverse individuals, love, love, lovers of all people, right? My so, so I had that at home. I wasn't a bully. I would never think of making somebody's life worse. But these individuals, for whatever reason that they were going through, and this is when we talk about cause and effect and people going through hard times. Most of the time, all these people were going through hard times in their own environment. So I develop an understanding later in life. Um, Anyway, so I went through physical bullying. I was attracted to social media and the positives and negatives of it all. And then ultimately with Megan being a girl, I think that, in truth, I think girls in general have it harder. I think boys are brought up to be just more, they're just tough. Like right off the, right off the get-go, they're jumping off couches and they're you know, skydiving yeah, cause, off furniture. Because when, when we think of bullying with boys going through school and stuff, we think about the physical. Yes, exactly. And the girls is more verbal manipulative so when you when you yeah. translate that to social media you can't translate physical to social media well done yeah and that and that is ex- you exactly right and then you get this um manipulation and talking behind backs and gossip and just like and i don't want to like i don't want to make it sound like one is more for the other it's just not but it tends to be that that way and now i have two the things that now drive me in life, my two daughters, mm-hmm. London and Haley, are the most amazing things that have ever happened to me. Like they are incredible girls. And I know now is like what I do and how I, I lead by example is how they'll turn out. And London's already a lover of she hugs like she again, COVID's been tough for her because she hugs everybody. Mm. She's a people lover. She loves people. She is not abusive. And I like to think that that's hopefully from... And it tears me up because, you know, what I told you beforehand is like, that's, you know, not going to... There's a there's a change coming. Sure, right? sure. Um, in divorce. But like that, that she's grown in this environment where she's a lover of people. And I look at her and I think you're going to be on the side that doesn't cause pain. And I hope that you're not also on a side that receives pain from Mm -hmm. this problem, which has only grown with the addition of the internet and social media, right? 
so now, so yes, so I already had this collective of things. I was bullied. I, I came to understand cause and effect of bullying, the waterfall effect that bullies are often a product of an environment or being bullied themselves. I got mm -hmm. help. I got support by my a friend supporting me and standing up for me, which stopped the bullying, mm -hmm. right? Um, I have the story. I have the suicide um, understanding that life can sometimes put you in a circumstance where it doesn't seem like it's worth it anymore. Um, I have friends that have also taken their lives because they're unhappy. Um, I have girls now that I want to mold into the right way. And I'm very conscious of, even in our group social medias, um, on the internet, how people, I'd see people all the time in Nextdoor, for example, mm. or in our social media or Facebook groups, that people would just say anything. There was like, to add another example, on fireworks night, right? So fireworks this year, people were doing it for days after July the 4th. It was going on constantly and people were doing it and, and it was... Ten, maybe a week or 10 days later, and a woman, an older lady, had posted on Nextdoor, please, whoever the, the, the people are that are still laying off fireworks, please stop because it, my, it causes my dog to have grief, right? Mm -hmm. it, was just, it was just a plea and a statement. And somebody came on and said, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't have dogs or maybe it'd be better off if they were just dead. Whoa. I hope the coyotes get them. They're just kids. It's like, would you say, like, as a person, if that old lady was in front of you, making this, it was just an innocent plea. It was like she'd had enough, obviously, of the fireworks. And she was just saying, it was like July 10th or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you please stop, like, please stop your kids from letting off the fireworks. And then for somebody, some grown adult to come in then and say, on the, and respond and say, this, mm -hmm. you know, would you say the same thing if that little old lady was in front of you? Would you say that to them verbally? And what gives you, what, why would you write this? Mm -hmm. So again, I think, yes, bullying and hatred in general is becoming easier and more acceptable for people to do. I've got... Daughters, I don't want to. I don't want to become that or be a victim of that. Yeah, it's a really, really big um, passion of mine. So I guess as far as the final question, how or like maybe what resources, re, what what mm. resources are out there? Yeah, or what yeah. what can we do about combating? You know, being being on the opposite side of of the fight. If you yeah, know. very good. How does yeah. So I think um, the first thing is guide. It starts with guidance. Um, I think that having good parenting at an early age to teach anti-hate diversity to be good to other people. And there was a. It's great that we have this uh, talk today. There was um, the Megan Mind Foundation. They have an Instagram channel, and uh, one of the the statements they put out there today, as one of the little quotes is that um, you never know what somebody else is going through, so mm -hmm. always be kind. I love this statement, it's true. Yeah, I don't know, like you may have come this morning from a really depressing circumstance. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody's going through something, right? So try to keep that in mind, that, that, that you don't know what somebody's dealing with, so try to, to be, just be the nicest mm -hmm. person you can mm -hmm. be, right? So anyway, so first of all, guidance. Encourage each other to be kind and don't hate diversity, acceptance, tolerance, um, and understanding that not everybody believes the same thing, but to know when it goes too far if they're trying to, 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 to push a, a, an opinion or belief too far and to step in and, and, and reduce it, pull people back from being too extreme, right? Mm -hmm. But there are organizations. The Megan Mai Foundation is obviously set up by the mother of somebody that 
committed suicide based on bullying. So they have great insight into what it means to be supportive against bullying and depression and, and suicide. Because suicide is tagged a lot to bu bullying. People, you know, get pushed over the edge, can't mm -hmm. take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's important to, to help people understand that bullying in itself doesn't end there. Sometimes it ends in death and horrible depression and long-term effects. Um, I think it's important to recognize that scars from bullying never fade completely. Most bullying episodes for people, and, and they stay, like you forget a lot, you forget at certain things, you block out certain things, some memories just dilute into time. Bullying scars seem to go with you through life, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, you get these notches on you. And you're always seemingly able to reference the bullying episodes. So keep, this, keep that in mind as, as, as we talk about being nice. So um, there are foundations. Megan Meyer Foundation, um, Born This Way Foundation with Lady Gaga is a great one too. Um, Stopbullying.org, there are government sites. Um, and when you are on need, like to, to talk to people, right? The, the thing that I try and encourage my girls to do is to, to always feel like they can talk to me mm -hmm. or talk to someone or open up and, and share what, you know, what, what, what you're going through. I think these are really important aspects. Hopefully that answers. No, it, it, it definitely does. Yeah. What I, about you, though? What, like, you join, you join the, the crew for a reason. Like, do you have a, a message about bullying or... I'm going to put you on the spot. There. No, I'm, I'm just a fan of, uh, I, mean, I was thinking about a quote that it's nice to be reminded of every once in a while. As, I mean, as you're talking, um, I like to, it's a lovey-dovey quote. I don't even know what the quote is. I like to butcher it. <laughs> but it's kind of like the, along the lines of, um, you know, like if people are being mean, love anyway. Yeah. If, if people are doing this, be nice anyway. Like being the rise being, above. Yeah, the kind of the rise above. Give even though you're not receiving. That kind of those kind of things are always stuff that sticks with me. And I know, like I've had stints with, kind of like what you mentioned too. Is like with, with friends and stuff where they start acting weird and something's not going right. And you're like, yeah. did, again, that I do something wrong, similar to the the story. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, actually. I could be I could distance myself from them because I'm upset with how they're treating me. But then you realize, well actually I don't know what's going on in their life. I'm just gonna I'm gonna be nice anyway and, and yeah, you know, yeah. play the friend because that's what I am and I'm not gonna well, like just understanding that things are complicated and uh, being there to support versus anything else and yeah. Uh, yeah. Then I'm I'm a, I'm a fan of of course the same same thing that you're trying to push on your daughters is leading by example, uh, especially with kids. I don't have kids myself, but I I, <laughs> I understand based that I was a kid once. Right. <laughs> that you do absorb these things that they don't that people don't know you're absorbing from them, but you you are impacting lives pretty uh pretty heavily. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, examples are very important. So. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And I think that the, the hardest thing to do out of everything, by far, and I get this, is to try and understand the bully. Right? Which, that, which, is, which is something that a lot of people don't want to do. Right. Like, it's like, right. because I, I, I've done, that's the thing with social media that I have a hard time with too, is people will often complain about the bully and then I have the tendency to want to be like, well, actually, I kind of get where they're coming from. Yeah. This is just what's going on with them. Yeah. Let's yeah. just understand that. And, but it's a weird, it's a weird scenario because I don't know what it's. A, it's a weird message to send. Is it's not really the message isn't get over it. The message right. isn't. It's just it's a weird. It's a, it's tough, right? Yeah. Because like let, let's just take Megan's mm -hmm. case for example, right? Um, Obviously, there was an adult not giving good guidance, right? So the initial bully, which was the classmate, didn't have a good representation in, in 
to do the right thing or to be the right person. So, and it's tough when you don't want to be sympathetic mm -hmm. to bullying, but you want to have an empathy to what somebody might be going through or what anybody might be going through in order to cause them to snap. And it's, and it's about cause and effect. So a good example is that we are now, we've been thrown into with COVID a complete change in how we educate our children, right? And I'll tell you this, I'll be completely open about the circumstance. So all of a sudden, um, London, I've got London in the office with me going through homeschooling every day, right? And so you're put into a brand new situation where your patience is definitely tested. And I'll say this for every mother and father that's dealing with homeschooling, yeah. is that you, you no longer, you can think that maybe you can put your child, a, a six or seven year old, sit in London with six when she started this homeschooling thing. You can sit them there and they'll go through their schoolwork and just, it doesn't happen, right? It's like they need constant help and attention and they want to engage with you. And that can push your patient's limits through this whole concept. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you, you're in a situation then of cause and effect where a new situation has caused you to, to, to reduce your patience level or temper level, right? Your fuse is shorter, right? Why I tell you this is because I was directly affected by a circumstance that, that, sh that, that, sh that took away some of my patience and definitely got me into a situation where I would, I have maybe snapped at my own daughter mm -hmm. in, in a moment or, you know, in, in the, that would never have happened if I wasn't in this circumstance, right? And I just want to acknowledge that there is a truth in cause and effect. Bullies are sometimes also bullied themselves or victims themselves. But to, to try and look at that, if you're a victim of being bullied by that bully, if you're a victim of that bully, it's difficult to do. Nobody wants to hear about that. They only want to hear about how they can resolve that situation and not care about what the other person mm -hmm. is going through. And especially when it results in horrible yeah. things. Yeah, because I think, I don't, I'm trying to, my best case scenario-ness of that scenario, I don't know. <laughs> My best case scenario <laughs> ideal of that circumstance yeah, yeah. is if I'm being bullied and I somehow come to the understanding of why I'm being bullied and what's going through their life, that bullying may longer may no longer have an effect on me or may have lesser effect. Yeah, is, all right. Is, right, is right. That, that's kind of mm -hmm. my hope and what the knowledge brings is it's not just like, oh, sweet, now I know what they're going through and I'm still getting yeah. bullied. Like, hopefully... There's some a level there, of there, there, there's some change in the reaction to it that helps get through. You, you're right, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's obviously a very complex, right? Because you're dealing with cause and effect emotion. In Megan's case, she chose to to take her own life because of it, right? As and again, there were probably other things going on. There were other things going sure, on, sure, of course, for depression. But it doesn't help to add to the liquid in the water that that spills over. Right, like ultimately, you can take so much. You don't want to continue to contribute things that, that push people over the edge. But it's complex. It's very complex. If you're a good person and you're being bullied, and you develop this understanding, that may um, contribute to 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 how you react to it or how you deal with the situation differently to somebody else that still sees it. Mm -hmm. Right. It all depends on us as a person. It's like we're all affected by different things and we have uh, and also a DNA structure, seasonal depression like we talked about. There are so many different things going on. The ultimate message is just try and develop young adults into being good human beings. Try to have empathy and understanding and, and learn it yourself and also teach others. And try and understand as well that everybody's, you know, people are going through different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And avoid it. Like, try either, try, try to avoid the circumstance, whether you're a bully or being bullied, to gain separation from, from 
these situations somehow, some way. Either don't try not to be the bully, try to separate yourself from 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 the bullying environment and the understanding. All of these things come into play. You know? It's it's very complicated, and it's just getting worse. It's just getting worse, like you said, because the social media is just another channel. It's it's exploded mm -hmm. dramatically mm -hmm. with that opportunity, and again globally, like. Somebody can target somebody from, you know, Australia to America and choose to say really unkind things to them. That even though they're, they're typed words, they still have a, mm -hmm. a, an emotional effect on the recipient. Yes. You know. Yes. So. There you go. I'll lead us out with. Yes. Uh, <laughs> with uh, thank you for the the conversation. Of course bullying and every in film and everything we've talked about today we could be expanded we'll probably have to chat again some other time later when because oh, stuff is always evolving stuff is changing you're on an awesome path and who knows what 2021 has in store for us i know right um but yeah no thanks for being on i'll leave it at that and uh i we talked about okay very simple very simple question Hopefully, Paul sure. doesn't stretch this one out. Right. Well, um, where can people follow you and in, in the film? Oh yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, Instagram, mm -hmm. Paul James Movies uh, is a good one. Um, the Movieproducer dot com that has the the blog and all of the links into the film and so on. Um, DreamMotionStudios dot com as well helps. Um, we have apparel as you know mm -hmm. the merch the merch you want to show it off here thank you oh my god that's right at the end we have the merchandise at dream motion shop that that also um proceeds go to the megan Meyer foundation which we're very proud of and um yeah i think uh, and obviously we've got some easter eggs in the film as well which is cool mm -hmm. we developed a quick social media site for that oh yes yes yeah. very nice uh, which will be which takes you to um from under thebridgefilm.com which mm. is for the film mm. so there you go uh, and, some shorts and uh, when can people what's when can people ex expect because uh, you're doing a festival run first yeah and then yeah. maybe I'm assuming a public release or something yeah but anyway, for sure for sure so so keep in the loop at all those at all those uh, resources and we'll keep in touch and talk again soon thanks again oh thanks for having me man it's like this has been fabulous and it's good to to chat about such things with a with also a, a passionate film person as yourself before we close how many how many projects have you done how many films oh, have you done no it's a lot right you've directed you've written produced oh come on you've got to give yourself some credit here. Um, Eddie also is yeah no um so the tally the running tally and stuff that i've produced myself yeah. i'm nearing a hundred self-produced projects it's amazing and then plus on top of that all my script supervisor work on the side of that right so so it proves that you can make a living in film yeah yes you can you can do it <laughs> you can do it <laughs> all right cool thanks bye man. thanks bye-bye <laughs>